I was flattered to be asked to do the intro until I found out that everybody else they were going to ask was already dead. Uh, <laughs> you know, it's like that movie where they say, I see dead people. There, there, there's a lot of dead people around that haven't been buried. I see them every day at work. So I, was at, I asked them why they picked me to do the intro, and, and they said it's a good training opportunity for the future because there's going to be a lot of people in cemeteries that are going to need training. <laughs> to which I said, I'm hoping, you know, I aspire to a, a higher plane. I'm hoping to be perhaps elevated and, you know, maybe if I'm going to be doing any entertaining, it would be at a higher level. And they said to me then that perhaps I should think of the cemetery as a good middle ground. So I said, any guidance talking to these folks? You know, who, who, who's actually interested in, in, in cemeteries and dead people and things like that? And look, we got a whole room full of them. <laughs> what should I talk about? They said, well, it's a grave topic. <laughs> I'm not responsible for all my material. <laughs> it's something you need to dig into. <laughs> it can be shallow or deep, but you have to excavate your topic to expose what lies beneath. It's not something to approach with a skeleton crew, and you should, you should bone up on it. Can't cover anything up, throw dirt on it over the problem. No, 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 no. Do not sneeze or cough in her face. You'll be greeted with dead silence. This is so bad. <laughs> you know, the funny thing about cemetery jokes is they're really not funny. It's about as serious as a funeral. They said the last thing, if everything else fails, just bury them with praise. On the subject of praise, this is a phenomenal opportunity, and this is a great conference. And I want to thank all the folks who were involved in putting it together, thank our hosts. It, it is a cri critically important activity that we do. I think those of you who wonder why you're here on a beautiful late spring day when you could be outside or doing something else, and yet here you are. I think you've already asked the question why you're here. I think you know why you're here, and you th I think you're dedicated to what it is that you're doing, and you're interested in learning more and being able to contribute more. And it, I have to tell you, it's vitally important what you're doing. I, I've, I've spent a lot of time in, in, in cemeteries, not just trying to pick up girls. Um, <laughs> I have spent uh, a lot of time it, back when I was a kid, I'd go hang out at cemeteries around this time of the year because my grandmother referred to this as Decoration Day. How many remember that term? Okay. Before Memorial Day became the vernacular that we use, it was Decoration Day, the day when we go to decorate the, the graves of our ancestors. And in those days, it wasn't as much focus on military, the military veterans as it was just our ancestral dead. And, and many times, too, that was before we had perpetual care of our, of our, of our cemeteries and things like that. So it, it's, it's really interesting what, what you do and, and why you do it. And uh, I have certainly benefited a lot myself in some of the research that I've done. Did an interesting piece of gene, genealogical research. And the rumor was that my great-great-grandfather had three wives. And my grandfather always joked, presumably not at the same time. And um, we were found some records, and we found where there was marriage records between one of the wives and my great-great-grandfather, but no death records. So we began to wonder, well, man, maybe they were at the same time. Uh, until we found that, that we found the grave of, uh, of his second wife, and uh, <clears throat> it was not at all where you would expect it to be. It was about 15 miles from home. And uh, come to find out through a lot of other research, and <coughs> once it was located, she was visiting uh, some cousins, and they buried her when she died because it was during a time of cholera. And they wanted those people planted as fast as they could for fear of transmitting the disease. Well, I found all this out just because somebody like you did the research necessary to not only find and preserve the grave, but also have the associated data with it. So it's, 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 it's phenomenal what you can do. And uh, 
you know, when I would go with my grandmother to the cemetery, she would tell me all these stories. Well, this is your great, 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 you know, and then, you know, these, all these people. So it gave me a tremendous sense of history and perhaps contributed to my own interest in, in history. So you have my great grandmother or my grandmother to, to blame for that, I suppose. I do want to do a couple of thank yous. Um, I, I want to thank Gertrude and, and all of her board for, their, for hosting us today. Dr. Uh, Benson and the Four Rivers Heritage Rivers Trust for their grant, and uh, that's critically important to being able to put this on today. The Anne Arundel County Trust for co-sponsoring today's activities. All the speakers and the panelists uh, who have some phenomenal presentations planned for you. All of the folks, thank yourselves for being here uh, and, and for giving of your time and resources to make all these things possible. So, uh, and, and thank Jane Cox for the humorous material. No, I can't blame Jane for that. I wouldn't tell a joke that bad. And I, Jane's too good of a staff person to throw under the bus, so uh, I, I, do, I do want to thank her. Uh, and, and, and she makes my life interesting. She's always, uh, she's always an optimist, and, and she's always got a phenomenal story to tell about something new that she has literally unearthed. And, and, and that wasn't intended to be a pun, but... Well, without further decomposition, uh, let, me, let me at this time recognize Jane Cox. Thank you, Jane. Good morning. I am so excited by this turnout. Um, when, when you say you're going to put on a, a symposium on a Saturday about cemeteries, you don't know what you're going to get. But I am so thrilled to see almost every single seat in here uh, um, filled. Um, for those of you that I don't know, there's a lot of familiar faces in the audience. My name is Jane Cox. I'm the Chief of Historic Preservation Cultural Resources for Anne Arundel County. And um, we envision this as a program <laughs> I knew what you guys were doing. Um, so we, we envisioned this as a program that is really um, both recognizing all of the historic resources in Anne Arundel County and specifically the Four Rivers Heritage Area. The Four Rivers Heritage Area did provide support and funding for um, putting on and, and planning the symposium um, so that we could really do outreach and talk about an issue that within our staff we get at least two or three phone calls a week about family cemeteries, about um, you know, trying to figure out how to take care of these resources, and oftentimes finding out new information. Um, so with our county preservation program, um, first before I get started, I do want to recognize a few people that, that made this happen by name. Um, the conference planning committee, um, Stacy Poulos in the back, who will be talking in a few minutes, um, is our archeological sites planner for Anne Arundel County, and she is the one that gets all the cemetery phone calls. Um, I'd also like to recognize Gwen Manso, who was um, our a coordinator, conference coordinator extraordinaire that's kept us all organized and prepared a lot of this material. Um, she was a consultant working with us. Um, I also want to recognize a few other staff and uh, consultants that have worked with us. Amelia Chisholm in the back is the county's archaeological uh, lab coordinator and manager. Um, she also has quite a bit of archaeological experience in cemeteries. Um, Judy Hannon is here today. She has been a longtime volunteer and intern with our program. She recently went on to um, get a real job and left us, but um, she is one of the most passionate cemetery you know, people I've, I've ever met. Um, I'd also like to recognize two other uh, county staff um, that are here today, Ruth and Jennifer in the back. Um, so we've got a lot of support from the county and uh, hopefully they'll, th this will help all of them understand what it is that we're doing when we talk about dead people in the office. It's, it's weird. Um, I'd also like to recognize, um, the, there's, there's a great representation from a lot of the, uh, the community, a lot of people that have vested interests. I know I've spoken with a lot of you about um, d different, uh, different individual cemeteries, but the other thing that we're looking at here is looking at this from a more of an academic and a, a management perspective. So um, we're really thrilled to actually have represent representatives from preservation planning offices for Calvert County, Kirsty, thank you for coming, um, Jen Stabler from Prince George's County, preservation planner, um, Brian Crane, who's one of our speakers from Montgomery County, um, Roberta Lehner from the city of Annapolis, 
Um, and I, it's, it's really a neat thing that we're able to bring those professionals together as well in, into this conversation. So um, thank you all for, for joining us. It's, it's great to see you. And hopefully we can put our heads together and figure out how to work on some of these things. Um, the other uh, group that I'd like to recognize is the uh, trustees of the Quaker Burial Gra Burying Ground. Um, we will be doing some tours um, of the burying ground uh, later today, and they have been so generous with allowing us to come walk through their space, the space, and we hope that this will also spark some uh, support and ideas for them as they go to manage what's a, a pretty impressive historic resource and cemetery. So um, with those uh, thank yous in mind, I want to just give an overview of what it is that um, our, our county program does to try to protect historic resources. Um, we do um, protect, count, the county protects historic resources including historic buildings, um, archaeological sites, and cemeteries. We are one of only six jurisdictions in the state that actually has a local protection for cemeteries, and these are the reasons why. It always hits the press. People are mortified by the fact, oh, get that one, mortified, yeah. Um, <laughs> I'll be here all day. Um, <laughs> that, that these cemeteries are, you know, the, the amount of disrespect that somebody who comes in and wants to develop a property, stones disappear, things happen. There are empty lots that you wouldn't think anything is there. So it is critically important that we have a mechanism in place, both legally, but also for the community to tell us when the stuff is happening and that's really a driving force of what we want to try to accomplish today you are going to be our cemetery preservation stewards we need the help we need the feet on the ground we need to know where these things are so um, you know so so we really do need stewards in the field beyond just the staff that we have at the county so that we can make sure that these these historic resources and cemeteries are historic resources they give you a hyper local storyline about who lived there who's connected what they did with their lives so um why do they matter? This, this is something where, where, you know, I think most of the people in this room probably have a, a bit of a, a, a passion or um, an understanding, but, you, you know, you really start to break down what, why these things are important and why is the government protecting them? These truly are a piece of our county's fabric. They are part of the built environment. When you drive into Galesville today, you literally can't get to Galesville without passing by on both sides most of the people that made this the place it is and when you dive into those names and you start to learn their stories that's i think where most of us are here it's about the people the stories and this physical connection they were buried here because this was their home so we are connecting back to a population to a group of people to really understand where we are today um, the other thing is from a more of this academic perspective um, Reading a cemetery, understanding the landscape, reading the stones, understanding the iconography on these stones, they start to tell us things that we might not have known otherwise. There's unspoken relationships. There are nuances of families that may only come out if you really delve into the information that it is carved in stone. <laughs> Um, we also see these as both genealogical, they're absolute treasure troves, as, as Phil pointed out. Sometimes you, you have to dig into the, um, you know, to what information is on the stone to verify what might be in written records and, and to make these connections. And there is a, a tremendous amount of archaeological potential. While we don't customarily go after excavating cemeteries, when that need arises, some of our panelists are going to talk about the nuances of why and when one might need to um, excavate a cemetery. Um, it really can provide incredible forensic data. Think about the, the you know, DNA, what you can do with that today. With some of what I'm hoping Janice will share with us is some of those connections to DNA and, and modern populations that didn't know who they were connected to and where they were connected. So it's a really exciting time, um, and I'm, I'm thrilled to see the, this turnout. Um, so just to give a little rundown of bringing this back to Four Rivers Heritage Area, no, the county does not have the measles. <laughs> These are all of the recorded and known cemeteries that we have in our GIS database. This GIS database, I would like to say that Stacy has been running around the co countryside with the GPS, but this is primarily founded on the incredible work of Tina Simmons. And if we could just take a minute, 
She is one of our panelists. You're going to hear more from her late, later. But without Tina, we would not have this. And she has been an incredible force. The goal here actually today is to try to clone as many of you as I can into Tina's. It, it's, it'll be easy. So take direction well. Um, so in the uh, Four Rivers Heritage Area, um, we have 500, or within the county total, we have 509 that we actually have a dot and a, a general location. Some were really good, some are a mile square that it's been reported. Um, we have 19 of these under a perpetual easement. Anne Arundel County's preservation program does require that when development is um, going to impact a cemetery, we require that it stay in situ, in place, and we have a permanent perpetual um, preservation easement to protect that cemetery and to protect the access for descend um, people that are, are associated with it. 145 of these cemeteries are in the Four Rivers Heritage Area. 88 of those are documented. 48 are reported. We kind of know where they are, but we don't have tons of specifics to be able to put it right on the ground. And Stacy's going to get into that nuance um, a bit later. And nine of them are recorded as being moved. Now, the, the notion of a graveyard uh, cemetery being moved, um, most people are kind of shocked when they find out that, that that's OK. Um, and in most jurisdictions, that is OK. All you have to do is get a letter from the state's attorney, do your background uh, notifications for um, finding descendants. And if nobody speaks up, they do um, often a mass removal and take it to a, another location. Um, in the county, we don't allow that because of the historic and cultural value. Um, now, another interesting number that, that as we are starting to really hone down our data and, and look at the, the details is um, with, with our, our cemeteries, um, in the Four Rivers Heritage Area, here, here's an interesting number to think about how cemeteries represent our local history in a way that sometimes the buildings that survive don't. In Anne Arundel County, about 8% of the structures um, uh, uh, that are on our official inventory of things that are, protect, are protected are actually de noted as being of African American in interest or has an African American component, 8%. In the Four Rivers Heritage Area, there are 39 African American heritage, uh, cemeteries, 27% of the cemeteries. So you start to see how the cemeteries might actually be more representative than what's left standing on the ground. And that, that can really add to our understanding of development of where those populations and communities have thrived. But that might be the only thing left, you know, bringing, bringing us to the fact that this is really an important resource to protect. Um, I mentioned that um, the county, or Anne Arundel is um, one of the, the few that actually does have local protections. We do that with a regulatory, our regulatory tool is within Article 17, site development. If you need a permit to develop your property, to grade, to build, to do a site development plan, um, you would have that program, that permit would come through our office. And our code requires that cemeteries be avoided and left in place. And with that, um, we require a 15-foot right-of-way to the nearest public or private road so that access can be re retained. And we require that perpetual preservation easement that I mentioned. Now, it, it, it's a good concept. Um, it can be a challenge to implement. Um, you wouldn't believe where some cemeteries are. Um, <laughs> if you've been to the Home Depot in Annapolis, Look closely next time you go to the Home Depot in Annapolis on Defense Highway and see what see if you see it. <laughs> um, so uh, it, it's it can be challenging, but it, to implement, but it's also an incredibly important thing to do. Um, so finally, before I, I turn this over to Stacy, um, who's going to get into a little bit more of our nuts and bolts of our program and what information we know and what information we're hoping you can help us enhance, um, we really have a, there's a range of cemetery types. Um, there's local graveyards that that are you know burials that are essentially in in a uh, in a, a farm or a backyard of a home. There are uh, more formal church cemeteries. There are individual, sometimes individual burials. Um, Gwen and um, actually her, her our, our uh, conference planner and her, her mother Thackeray are, are, is also here. They have experience with one of those one, one cemetery, one burial cemeteries in a uh, burial that was found on their property about 15 years ago of a boy that was buried in 1655. 
in the bottom of a cellar hole and then covered with trash. That one cemetery, if, it, it, at the breaks, I'll also point out, if you want to hear that story, it's in this book. There's some great pictures. So, um, so, so you know, understanding these different types of resources really means that you know, knowing about them, having good documentation, so that we can use the tools that we have available to try to protect what we can. But we really do think that this is not something that Stacy and Darian and I can pull, pull off um, to, to, uh, to do on our own, and we really do need your help. So one of our goals of today is to really you know, spark your imaginations. Let's think about cemeteries. They are pl important places of commemoration. They're important historic resources and, and incredibly informative. And they truly are worthy of preservation and of further study. So we hope today that we'll be able to you know, really develop a, a stronger network of um, cemetery enthusiasts, which I think some of you already might be. So um, with that, uh, we, we look forward to um, having, having a, a great uh, session today. We've got some wonderful panelists. And we really want this to be an interactive and engaging um, conversation. So um, after Stacy's done her, her uh, presentation, we will uh, take just a short break um, as we get the panelists set up. And then um, we'll be able to hear some really interesting, interesting presentations by people that are on the ground and digging it up. So. <laughs> Thank you very much, and I'll, I'll turn this over to Stacy now, who is our uh, archaeology and cemetery sites planner. Thank you. Good morning. Thank you all so much for being here. Thank you to our speakers, to everyone out there. This I'm so nice to see such a big crowd. And um, I'm really appreciating all the deadpan humor I've been hearing from people. <laughs> so. Um, okay, I'm going to save it. That's my only one, I promise. <laughs> uh, so uh, Jane was touching on, um, you know, what our county does, what, what we preserve, uh, and uh, what we know. You know, we know a lot about cemeteries in Anne Arundel County. We know that there's more than 500 of them. Uh, we know um, where a lot of them are, and we keep this information in a spatial database. And uh, Darian, if you can get to the next slide. And this uh, spatial database is actually available for you all to look at as well. We have um, in the map room on the fourth floor uh, in Annapolis, we have um, in our office building on Reaver Road, we have a mapping station where you can go in and see where these cemeteries are located. And you'll see they're color coded differently. And that's where we have our documented cemeteries. We have those moved cemeteries. And then we have those cemeteries where we're like, we know about them. Uh, we just don't know um, exactly where they are. We know that they used to be on this 200 acre parcel and a quarter acre was set aside for a cemetery, but we don't know where that quarter acre is anymore. Um, so that kind of uh, conundrum. Um, so for us, it's really important in order to protect these that we know where they are. So that's our big goal, is to know where the, these are located. Uh, another resource that's available for you is also on our county webpage. If you go to acounty.org slash CR, short for cultural resources, you can find our historic property search tool. And um, if you type in your address or tax account, you can see if your, your property has been flagged. And if it hasn't, and you know there's a cemetery on it, we, we would really love to hear from you. <laughs> so um, all uh, this database, as uh, Jane mentioned, w uh, came out of the hard work of the Anne Arundel Genealogical Society. And Tina did this monumental effort of putting all that data together into a book. And then we made it into a computer map. And, uh, and so uh, that's our main resource, our main management tool for uh, dealing with these cemeteries. Now, how did we find that out? Um, research, documentation. There, if you don't mind uh, checking uh, the next slide. Uh, panel one is going to be talking about that. With research, genealogy, and documentation, we get to identify where those cemeteries are, you know, those general locations. We get to identify who's in the cemetery. Um, Tina Simmons will be talking about the hard work that the Genealogical Society has been doing to document all those cemeteries in the county over the the years, and uh, Janice Hayes Williams, who is also here, is going to talk about how um, research has helped us illuminate who is in the cemeteries at Crownville Hospital, for example, these unmarked places, and how these stories um, all interconnect together. So, without research genealogy, we don't know necessarily the story that's in there about those specific people. But uh, 
and then uh, Brian's going to follow up in talking about the documentation. I keep saying, if we don't have it recorded, if we don't know its location, we can't protect it. And documentation is so important for us to do that. So I'm really excited about the first panel. They're going to be um, narrowing down uh, some of the foundation of what our, um, our uh, knowledge of the Anne Arundel County Cemeteries is. And that's going to be followed by uh, our next panel. That will be coming up. Um, where we get into uh, the stuff we don't know from those written records. You know, we have um, amazing resources like the Joan Cass Beck collection here with all these amazing books that help us figure out how to navigate through those paper records. But sometimes uh, in order to really understand a cemetery, you have to go out to the field, you have to look at it, and uh, it's not always clear exactly what the extent of a cemetery is. And that's where archaeology is really essential for us because we not only want to know where it is, we want to know what it is, what its extent is. And, uh, and these places have these secrets that you don't even know sometimes are out there. But uh, if you go um, back a sec, Darian, you can sometimes guess. You see things in the field, like the depressions here that are filled up with water. That's a pretty good clue. Um, or the changes in vegetation. Uh, so we have these non-invasive methods uh, that sometimes help us out, like some, some are more radical than others, like cadaver dogs. This lovely, uh, lovely young uh, lab right there helped us out with um, figuring out just the extent of this one cemetery. He ran around, it was about a 60-year-old to possibly older cemetery. So these are uh, non-invasive methods to really start understanding what you're dealing with. But uh, sometimes you need to dig or uh, uh, look a little deeper. So uh, one trick of the trade is to use remote sensing. That's a non-invasive way. Uh, right here, we're at White Hall with a ground penetrating radar. Um, there's a marked cemetery. And then right next to it is a really humongous African-American cemetery that has no markers save for one. Um, and uh, ground penetrating radar can help you narrow down what the extent is there. So you can see that profile right there, that little bump, that's a burial uh, that's hidden below the surface. But sometimes you have to dig to figure out what's there. And you can also do that non-invasively. Like right here, you have trenching and where you can expose the tops of the shafts. But um, archaeology, uh, you know, there's uh, has so much more potential too. Cemeteries are amazing archaeological resources. Sometimes we don't have paper documents to tell us who the people are. Sometimes we don't know what we're dealing with. Um, sometimes it pops up the cemetery that you didn't know was there during archaeology. And uh, I know that um, Jeannie Ward and Tom Bodor in our next panel are going to really be getting into the the intricacies of that. Jeannie will be talking about it from the perspective of someone who is on the Quaker burying grounds trustees as well, So she and also as an archaeologist who deals with compliance, which is one of the main drivers for investigating an archaeological site um, in, uh, through the county code. And Tom will be looking at our endangered sites. In uh, North America, we don't really excavate so often for research. Usually when we're excavating a site, it's because the site is endangered. Uh, and then the research kind of happens as a result of that. But uh, our, I'm sure our panel will elaborate a little bit further too on the potential that archaeology has too for these resources. And um, so this is a lot of the stuff that I've been talking about from the county perspective. Um, you know, the stuff that we need, we need archaeology in order to find those boundaries. Um, and we um, get a lot of it done through compliance through the county code. But we also need our citizens' help to preserve what's within those boundaries. We can only protect the extent, we, um, but we don't have the resources for the conservation or preservation. That's where we rely on the community involvement of people like you. So many of you out there I know who are invested in helping us uh, save these incredibly important places. And Howard Wellman on our panel is going to be talking about that professional conservator. He will be giving you advice on what you as a, a lay person could do out in the field and when you need a professional's help. And I think this is going to be a really fascinating morning. So. Um, and is that my last slide? <laughs> uh, so yeah, conservation, one of the things that we run into is that um, people don't understand the value of the historic markers as well, and Howard's going to talk a little bit further about that. Uh, I'm throwing out a quote there um, that you'll see, and um, it starts off this book here. Uh, the fence around a cemetery is foolish, for those inside can't come out, and those outside don't want to get in. 
Well, I appreciate the sentiment, I truly do, but actually I really love those fences because they help us protect those cemeteries. So um, we're gonna get a little into that today, so thank you all for coming out here. <laughs> and um, we're gonna talk a little later too about what more you can do as a citizen preservation steward for our county. Thanks. <laughs> Hi, I'm Tina Simmons. Um, there was a reference earlier. I've been researching cemeteries in the county for over 30 years for the Genealogy Society. Uh, one reason is to make that information available for people who are researching their family histories and people who are doing historic research. Um, we have a lot of unique burials here in this county. We have what are thought to be the oldest tombstones in Maryland. They're at St. James uh, Church, and they date to 1665. We've got signers of the Declaration of Independence. We've got governors of Maryland. We have the founder for Alcoholics Anonymous. We have relics for St. Justin, who was beheaded in the se second century AD. We have a Redemptorist Priest Cemetery. We have Quakers who are buried in the Quaker burial ground without tombstones. We have cemeteries that are almost totally in Greek and Hebrew, and ones that had been here in this county that were Russian Orthodox and written in Cyrillic. They were moved when BW Airport was expanded, and they're now in Howard County or Baltimore County. We have a lot of institutional cemeteries. We have Crownsville State Hospital. We have one at the Maryland House of Corrections. We have two that were associated with the District of Columbia. Um, they had people buried at Forest Haven and Cedar Knolls who were um, either mentally or physically challenged and institutionalized because that was the practice of the day. We have a marine quarantine hospital that was up near Curtis Bay. Uh, that housed a lot of people who were from Baltimore and northern Anne Arundel County who died of smallpox. And we have a POW cemetery at Fort Meade. Uh, they had German and Italian POWs who were buried there. We have unknown slaves. We've got former slaves who were later freed. We've got people who were lynched. We have all sorts of information on people who died and were buried in Anne Arundel County. And we try to put that together with a, a variety of sources. Uh, I saw a, um, a quote from someone, and I really like this. Cemeteries are a time capsule of an area's unique history. Each stone is an irreplaceable record of an individual and the time they were here on Earth. I find the symbols, poems, and epitaphs add to the individual's life story. I start researching and get to know not only the people of the time, but also a snapshot of the town, town as well. I see the hardships, loss, and celebrations when I start connecting with the town's genealogy. We have neglected cemeteries. We have ones that have been vandalized, ones used for <coughs> dumping grounds, ones that are being ignored by their property owners. Uh, a lot of people aren't even aware of the existence of a cemetery on their property. People have died, they've moved away, they have gotten too elderly to care for their cemetery, and some just simply lack an interest. Um, as, as we pointed out, Anne Arundel County is one of the few that um, takes care of, of their cemeteries in the fact that they don't move them. There's a single s stone that's in um, Saverna Park that's in an area that's due to be developed. The developer will be making a U around that cemetery location just to preserve that single site. 
uh, that gives you an example of, of what they're doing. Our goal is to research the cemetery, record the information, check it against other inscriptions. Sometimes I have five or six different people who have gone to that cemetery and written down the information and given it to us, and there are discrepancies. Um, people see different things when they look at the same information. Um, so it, it's calling out what's accurate and preserving that. Then researching other family histories and other information to add to the, that record. Uh, a lot of what I've been doing in the past few years is just working with other sources of information. Uh, death certificates, obituaries, funeral home records to put together a more complete idea of who's buried in that cemetery that may not even have a headstone. Uh, there's a handout in, in your packets that gives information on how to find cemeteries, how to do some of that initial documentation, so I won't go into that, but um, we have a lot of cemeteries in the county that we don't even know the ownership. Um, because cemeteries are on property that's not taxable, that information sometimes falls off the radar. Sometimes it, it was initially listed in deeds and it hasn't been carried forward in, in current deeds. So all those are issues that, that we're constantly dealing with and I work closely with the county to try to make all the sites that I know of make the county aware of them as well so that these don't get neglected and, and destroyed. Thank you. Gertrude, why is it so cold over there in that corner? <laughs> Got a fur coat for me to put on over there? Thank you, everybody, for coming today. It is so nice to be here. Um, my talk today is going to be split a little bit outside of the Four River Heritage Area and inside of the Four Rivers, Rivers Heritage Area. I have become a steward for the Crownsville State Hospital Patient Cemetery. Most people didn't know the state hospital had a cemetery. Even one of the uh, superintendents didn't know. I got a phone call looking for my uncle, George Phelps. Many of you all may remember the late George Phelps who was responsible for restoring the Brewer Hill Cemetery. He got a call from a mayor from the city of Annapolis and said, hey, Mr. Phelps, if you don't clean up that black cemetery, we're going to blacktop it. This is real. So Mr. Phelps raised $95,000 from the community just by buying a brick to restore the front, to restore a historic cemetery where African Americans are buried. Uh, Phil Hager is gone, but when he talked about the fact that his family member married uh, more than one, had more than one wife, well, that's how I learned my story of a great uncle by the name of Wally H. Bates. And I found out that he married two of my great grandmother's sisters because I fell into the lot in, to, in the cemetery before it got cleaned up. So anyway, those stories are real. So Mr. Phelps cleaned up Brewer Hill. So Crownsville is looking for him because the superintendent says, guess what? I just found out I have a cemetery. If you were driving down 97, you see an overpass called Farm Road. The cemetery is on the other side of Farm Road. The cemetery was cut into by the state of Maryland as they built 97. Some of it we think probably even washed away. There are about 1,600 graves there. There's only about a couple of hundred stones that started maybe 1,100. Can I get you? Do you have a clicker for me or are you going to do it for me? So what we say about people in 
institutions, mental institutions, African Americans, that they were marginalized in life and forgotten in death. A cemetery not quite forgotten because it belongs to the state of Maryland. It sits on Bacon Ridge, a thousand acres of passive use for the community that is owned by Anne Arundel County and inside of Bacon Ridge, there's a small 10 acres that belongs to the state of Maryland that houses the cemetery. When the, when the uh, hospital closed in 2004, our former county executive, John Leopold, said, I'm going to be connected to the cemetery. So as he began to grow Bacon Ridge with the first 42 acres, inside of that was the cemetery. And he said, you know what, Governor Maryland, Anne Arundel County Recreation and Parks will take care of it. I know they're sorry about that because I get to call the phone and say, it's a dead deer up there. It's, it's beer bottles, it's whatever, so I get to call them to clean it up. So we, Anne Arundel County, take care of this cemetery. No names on the stones, only numbers. That's why I say, uh, say my name. It's vast. This is what it looks like. These are what the stones look like. They're laid down now because normally people who have to take care of a cemetery want it to be easy, so it's easier if you just lay the stones down. It's only one remaining, one remaining stone that is standing. And when I went up there with my Uncle George, we said to my, ourselves, oh dear God, who are these people? So I asked for volunteers, about 10 of them. It took us about 10 years, but we know everybody's name. Now we can say their names. Close to 1,600 African Americans plus one Caucasian woman. How in the world did she get up there with all those black people? <laughs> she committed suicide on the railroad and to remove her body quickly, the family allowed the state hospital to bury her there on Bacon Ridge. So we start to comb through the death records. That's the only way to find out. One by one for 10 years. Okay, we started in 1910. That's when the hospital opened. The first burial is 1911. We have a name, and we just go from there. It is the saddest job that any volunteer could possibly experience. You see the cause of death. You see people who wind up having children, but they've been there in the hospital for 10 years. How is that possible? Stillborn babies, babies uh, uh, people killed by electroshock therapy, hypothermia. Suicide, we have all those names, the stories we would never tell. You have a name, you go and look at the death certificate and find out how these people died. People are there from over 30 states in the union. Over 30 states, how is that? You all ever heard of the Great Migration? When African Americans said, we're leaving the South and we're going North? A lot of them didn't make it. They wound up in big cities like Baltimore, fell asleep on the streets, and disappeared. There's a book about Henrietta Lacks, who lived in Turner Station. And in that book, the people in the neighborhood said, we're scared to death of the night doctor. What in God's name is the night doctor? If you live in Baltimore, you know that you do not get drunk and fall asleep because you may never be seen again. Because they believe that the doctors from Johns Hopkins would sweep you up off the street and you would wind up on a slab for a medical student. Well, in my research with Crownsville, if I kind of found out that to be true, to, that to be true, excuse me, people who didn't have families were buried there People who didn't have families were also taken to the university 
of Maryland to be cadavers for the medical students. The burials at Crownsville around 1940 when the autopsy board is established start to go this way and the cadavers being sent to the medical school because there's no family start to go this way. A superintendent is basically a coroner. That's what the state of Maryland says. So what we've done now is we've taken a whole of this cemetery and we do stewardship because nobody is ever going to forget the Crownsville Cemetery. We even had legislation. Um, here's a stone in the 1950s. They started writing the names in there in the cement. <coughs> When the cemetery closed in 2004, the legislators wrote legislation to make sure, House Bill 1351, to make sure that this cemetery was taken care of. You can do the next one. These are some of the people. Uh, this is the purpose of the House Bill. When you have a state cemetery, you can do this. You can go and lobby to your delegates and say, you need to take care of this. We have the constituents behind us take care of the laws. Now, did they give us a right of entry into the cemetery? Anybody want to answer that question? <laughs> Never happened, except for I have a big mouth. And Ed Riley just got so tired of me and my big mouth, he just gave me a key. So I got a key to the cemetery. If anybody wants to go up there and see the cemetery, you can. Once a year, we do something called Walk for the Woods, with the Scenic Rivers Land Trust. On that day, I do a ceremony called Say My Name. In a basket, I have all these names of people who were buried. You take a name. In another basket is a basket of rose petals. I have a girlfriend, and I made her create a song. Her name is Scotty Preston, and it's called Say My Name. We sing that song. We say those names. And we do cleanup. You can go to the next one. Can you do a couple? I want to show you. The people who come out and do stewardship. Next one. Kids, young people cleaning up the cemetery. They find all kinds of things there. Next one. See that guy right there? Do you all know him? His name is Stuart Pittman. Even the county executive comes out to clean up that cemetery because we have to remember that these were voices that didn't have a voice. We are their voice at this particular point, and we take care of this cemetery. So I want to switch. Do I have five more, three more minutes? A couple more minutes. couple more minutes. Next one. OK, this is my new boyfriend, everybody. <laughs> I'm vested in the respect and dignity of the African-American community African-American cemeteries because somebody has to take care of them too. This is my new guy. His name is Smith Price. He was the slave of Daniel of St. Thomas Jennifer, a slaver, a merchant in the city of Annapolis, the uncle of Thomas Stone, signer of the Declaration. He was able to get his freedom made well with that freedom. Currently, he was a artisan and made money. The moment he got freedom, he was, he was in Annapolis and got land called, a place called Acton Lane. Some people know it as City Gate Lane now. Some people know it as Larkin Street. He purchased the first acres of Acton to build a black community. He even purchased all the way down on the Spar Branch, a farm where he planted 100 apple trees, 100 peach trees. We find out later that his son sells brandy, oh, apple and peach, on Main Street. <laughs> he dies in 1807, and he gives the land for the first African-American church in Anne Arundel County that we know today as Asbury United Methodist Church. He died in 1807 on his own private estate called Green Hill Estate. How do I know all this? Well, he has a great-grandson 
who is the first doctor in the world to perform open heart surgery, Dr. Daniel Hale Williams, who writes a book and talks about hanging out in his great grandfather's private cemetery. 1980, the city of Annapolis pushes urban renewal. City Gate Lane is purchased. African Americans were living in, in that area, what they call at that time slum housing, slum housing. Urban renewal leveled the place. The African Americans went into public housing and they built these townhouses. And as they were building, this backhoe driver heard something crunch. And he got out of his uh, a backhoe, looked down, and he had cut into a coffin. If you notice, part of the skull is cut off here. This is the coffin of, of my new boyfriend, Smith Price. So I've got to fight for his life right now. Buried next to him was a son. They did the right thing, and they called the state of Maryland because we have laws. State of Maryland whisked them away. Nobody, know where he, nobody knew where he went. So I'm starting to be trained as a historian in Annapolis, all the great people. I get to meet Tina and Jane McWilliams and Jean Rusto and Constance back there, and they're teaching me, and they're telling me about this story. So I start to look for this guy. 20 years, I've been looking for him. This is no, this is no joke. As a representative at the time, bless his soul, the late Michael Bush, I represented him on the Maryland Heritage Area Authority. And right after his death, we have a meeting at Jefferson Patterson Park Museum, and I cry all the way there, because this is my last time ever seeing my name with Mike Bush's as his representative. And through all that grief, we're doing a tour, and. Something says, just ask these people, do you have any bones down here? <laughs> Lady said, what? Do you have any bones down here? And they said, well, we'll look, and I'm doing a tour, and they tap me on my shoulder, and they beckon me to come into this room. And they say, Miss Williams, so where do you think these bones are from? I said, from the city of Annapolis, right in the heart near the state capitol. And do you have a name for these bones? I said, I think it's Smith Price. And they go in and look, and the lady says, the Smith Price Graveyard? This happened on April 11th, 2019. 20 years of me looking for this dude, I have found him. I am in the process with my church of bringing him home the paperwork I have a f another full-time job now. The paperwork to bring him home, to repatriate him, is amazing. I now have working with me, I think the county, uh, the state of Maryland. We're going to remove him from Jefferson Patterson Park Museum in the next 30, 60 days. He's got to travel again. He's going to Baltimore to a lab where we're going to attempt to do DNA. We have people who believe they're related. And then he's coming home to Annapolis. And Ginger is over there. She's over there getting ready to tear up because St. Anne's Church has committed to, this is a reinterment. This is wild, isn't it? This guy's been all over the world. His mother's from Santa Domingo. And they come to Annapolis to be enslaved. And then they get free. And then he's in a box on the state capitol under the Shaw House for 10 years. And then he's taken to Jefferson Patterson Park Museum. And now he has a new girlfriend. And I'm taking him to Baltimore. And then I'm bringing him back to Annapolis. Thank you. If you have any questions, I guess we'll get them later, OK? Thank you so much.
So good morning. Um, I'm Brian Crane. I'm archaeologist with the Historic Preservation Office of uh, the Montgomery County Planning Department. And I'm going to talk this, uh, this morning um, about what we're doing in Montgomery County around a, a new program that we've started this past year around cemeteries and burial sites in Montgomery County. I've got a lot of slides. I'm not going to, you know, I'm not going to spend a, um, time on all of them. I mean, this is essentially a, a presentation I've, I've given elsewhere. So, um, you know, if you want a copy of it, you can get one. Uh, get the next slide. So, um, we have a we have an inventory of all the cemeteries and burial sites that we know about in Montgomery County, and it was developed by uh, volunteers over the course of many years. Uh, uh, well before 2004, the date on that slide, I mean, there were genealogists and local historians who were gathering information about cemeteries and burial sites. Uh, starting in 2004 to 2010, there was a, a formal effort on the part of a number of uh, volunteer organizations uh, led by Peerless Rockville, uh, with the help of a number of others, to, to, to uh, pull all the local histories and, and uh, published genealogies and all the other information they could find to make an inventory of all the, uh, the sites and burial sites uh, in the county. And then um, in, in 2017, uh, Montgomery County passed two new ordinances that provide some protection for burial sites in, in the county. One requires the planning department to maintain an inventory of all those sites. Uh, and the second requires that the, the planning department um, protect the location of those burial sites during a parcel subdivision review. In other words, if somebody's got a farm, they're, they're, they're going to you know, parcel it up into, into smaller pieces to develop it, and there's a cemetery there, they have to parcel the cemetery off separately in order to preserve it. So um, uh, Montgomery Preservation Incorporated mounted this massive volunteer effort. I think they had over 80 volunteers that went out in the field to try to go to every one of those, at that point it was some 260 cemeteries in the county, to try to get each one of them, take a, you know, fill out a standardized form and, and take a, a standardized set of photographs and phone GPS points so that we would have a, you know, a good uh, inventory to start with. And they also did some additional research to try to find some new cemeteries. And so the, the total came to over 300, 324 I think. Um, and so you see on this slide, um, uh, that's a screenshot of, of um, the, the uh, inventory that I'm tasked with uh, maintaining. So this was given to us uh, in last December, and then I have you know did a lot of QA on it, added some additional ones that we knew about in, in archaeology and historic preservation. So there you see it. All those green dots are, are places where we're confident about the location. Either it's you know still visible on the surface, or we have really specific historical information. There's a you know there's a deed map, or something that shows where an unmarked uh, cemetery was, uh, and then you'll see some of these other dots. Those are like hollow dots. Those are ones where we know historically that there was a cemetery, but we don't know exactly where it was. I mean, it could be, you know, somewhere out in this farm field. We know that there was a cemetery, but we don't know exactly where, and it's not marked any longer. Um, you'll see some of these sort of large hatched areas. Those are places where we know that there are um, archaeological sites that have human remains that date before uh, the era of, of European colonization. Uh, those are sites that are maintained by the Maryland Historical Trust, so we kind of redact the, the locational information, and what's on there is the boundaries of the parcel. In this case, you know, there tend to be, you know, it's the boundary of CNO Canal Park <laughs> in the entirety of uh, the, the shoreline of the, of the Potomac River because there are late, uh, late woodland burial sites uh, in a number of places along the river that date from probably from the 1400s. Um, next slide. So the, this is one of the ordinances I already talked about. The next slide, this is the one that protects them. So the types of cemeteries that we, you know, we've got uh, family burial grounds, churchyards, community cemeteries. Uh, burial sites of enslaved persons. Pausing on that for a moment, we only have a handful of cemeteries in Montgomery County that are thought to have been specifically associated with the people that had been held in slavery. And yet we know historically that um, something like a third of the county's population before the Civil War were people held in slavery. So we know we're missing a lot. <laughs> we know we're missing a lot of cemeteries. Uh, so we, we just don't know where all those people were buried. And so it's one of my 
you know, uh, mid to long term goals is to figure out where are all those burial sites. You know, they, they don't appear to be marked anymore, but they had to have existed. Um, also, Native American burial sites. We have seven. Uh, people lived in Montgomery County for 10,000 years before Europeans got here. 10,000 years of occupation, we have seven burial sites. So, you know, so another, you know, long-term uh, long goal to be able to pr protect those sites if we can find them. Next slide. You just did examples. Um, oh, so no, pause. Um, so, um, uh, so now I, I have this inventory. It's mostly uh, dots on a map. And I would like to replace that. With, you know, dots on the map that we are sure about, dots on the map that we're not at all sure about. And I would like to replace those with polygons that we're sure about for all of those. In other words, you know, actually map the sites so we can help manage them a little bit better by knowing their boundaries and try to track down the ones that were, mm, we know kind of where it was, but not really. Uh, and also, we want to uh, spend some time recording vulnerable headstones. Um, you know, um, there are a lot of gravestones that, that you know, they're, they go missing, they fall over, they break. Uh, there are certain materials that are really durable, granite, uh, um, uh, Seneca sandstone is really durable, but there are lots of others, like marble, that are just melting away in acid rain. You know, they're really vulnerable to uh, atmospheric conditions. And we're losing them. We're losing those inscriptions. So, um, so I'm going to talk this morning a little bit about some technology that we're incorporating to help get better maps and also to help record inscriptions. So I call this like 21st century gravestone rubbing. Uh, next slide. Yeah, so uh, what I'm doing for mapping is a process called photogrammetry. Uh, so camera mounted on a pole, usually higher up. Uh, you take a sequence of overlapping digital photographs. Software lines those pictures up in 3D space by uh, finding match points. I mean, you've probably all seen software like this. Like if you, you know, take a bunch of pictures in a row, software will turn it into a, a nice panorama for you. Well, there's software that will do the same thing, but in 3D space, right? So it lines up um, the, the photographs based on match points to how they line up in three dimensions, shoots the pixels out to where they line up, and then you get a really detailed 3D model from that uh, that also happens to be really good for mapping. So these are some of the tools I use. Next slide. Yeah, so this is a, it's an example of a 3D model. This is a Cook family burial site in Montgomery County. So, so one of the cool things is that you actually get a really detailed picture, not just a, of the map sort of looking down. So we're knowing where all the, the gravestones are, where, where they are right now, like to a millimeter. But also, like, you know, are they leaning? Are they broken? What's their present condition? So it's a, you know, it only t it took me a couple of hours to take the photographs for this burial site. You know, so I don't know, it was like half a day uh, to take the photographs. But you, then you get a model that that has a whole lot of information, and you can share it with the public. Uh, that's actually a screenshot from um, a website called um, 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 Sketchfab. So Sketchfab, you can, you can make it password protected, you can make it hidden so it's not discoverable, or you can make it totally public and you know, people that are just sort of browsing around on, on sketchfab.com can see your model. So it's actually a really great way to, to uh, share information. You can you know, spin it around, you can zoom in, you can add sort of text boxes and, and such. So anyway, uh, next slide. So yeah, some of my tools, there's a GPS uh, re uh, recording you know, uh, there in the corner, it's my, my base station. Uh, move on, next one. Right, so here's, so one of the outputs of, of this, um, uh, the photogrammetry map is an ortho mosaic uh, photograph. So the software stitches all those photographs, all, all that information together into, a, into an ortho rectified, um, that is uh, an image that's, that's um, it's georeferenced and, ortho, and orthographic. So it's without perspective. It's like an aerial photograph that's you know, incorporated, incorporated or can be incorporated into a GIS. So this is the Cook family burial site. So the background is the, you know, just my you know, aerial photograph from my GIS uh, in the computer with some topographic lines put in. And then you can see the, you know, my ortho mosaic image that I've created from the, from the 3D model. Next slide. So zooming in a little bit, a little bit closer. Uh, next slide. And zoom in a little bit closer. That's all the same image. And now you're getting to a point where you can actually almost read the inscription on the stone. So uh, again, this was like from a half a day's worth of, of taking photographs uh, to get a map that's you know georeferenced and you know internally it's the, the internal accuracy of the map is 
uh, within a millimeter. Uh, the accuracy of that map in you know world uh, world coordinates um, within a, <clears throat> probably less than well less than a meter. So uh, so it's a, it's a really accurate way of mapping sites. So it's so really good for uh, recording existing conditions um, and having a baseline of, of where all the stones are now. So, um, and you see a scale there. Um, so moving on. Right, so um, another, I, uh, sometimes I've been trying to, to record uh, locations with a little less time than a few hours that it takes to take the photogrammetry. So this is just a GPS unit. So I've got a, two GPS units. One's out in, the, in a field acting as a base station, and then I've got another rover station. And this is, a, um, this is the Prather family burial site in Montgomery County. Um, and so I, you know, that, that was the point you know, taken by a volunteer for the, um, with a phone, just the you know, phone GPS. So I wanted to see how accurate that was. And I took points all around the, the perimeter and then uh, points of individual um, 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 markers and, and um, boundary stones. It's not terrible, um, but that line should be straighter than it is, right? So even with a, just the GPS unit, you know, um, there's a, you know, it's with, accurate to within a meter. Um, so that's, that's good for certain purposes, but if your point is to map to the, uh, to get a really accurate layout of where the stones are within the cemetery, it's not, you know, so GPS units, not really quite enough. <coughs> anyway, uh, next slide. But where it's really good is uh, checking for the accuracy of the location of a, of a cemetery site. So this is, um, uh, oh, come on, Brian, this, uh, what is the name of this? I'm blanking on the name of the cemetery, which is really unfortunate, but it'll come to me in a second. So there was a cemetery uh, associated with uh, Seneca Sandstone workers uh, that was thought to be in, in um, uh, Seneca Falls, excuse me, um, uh, Seneca Creek State Park. And, there, and I went along with a uh, you know, friends of Seneca Creek State Park hike to go visit this cemetery site. And I went along with them because it's, it's, way, it's way off in the woods. I mean, it's, you know, it's a couple miles south of River Road. So it's not easy to get to at all. So I, I probably wouldn't have found it on my own. So I, I tied along with them. And I took my GPS uh, recording just to sort of take some points. So that's where they thought they were. This is where they were. <laughs> and, and that matters because that's actually Sino Canal Park. So you know, that boundary is the boundary of the National Park. And the Park Service didn't know that this uh, cemetery site was on their land. Uh, the state thought it was the, on their land, and, and the, the, the Park Service didn't know about it at all. So you know, I had to call up um, the, the, my, uh, my friends at the Park Service and say, um, hey, did you know? Uh, <laughs> and I'm definitely I'm really sure about that location. I mean, you, know, it's, you can see it's on a high promontory over uh, the floodplain of the Potomac River with a you know, deep gorge on one side. I mean, there was, you know, looking at where I was, it was like no question where we were. Next slide. Especially since we had hiked along, this is a historical era photograph from 1970, and we hiked along an obvious road. Every once in a while, you'd see a telephone pole, kind of a hint, right? And, and that road is no longer visible, but an aerial photograph is quite plain, and it was right at the end of that. that. Anyway, so, uh, so the GPS w was a big help in, in correcting that, that <coughs> crucial bit of information. Uh, next. Um, so um, another... Um, uh, technique that I'm using the photogrammetry for is for uh, recovering hard to read inscriptions. So here's, this is from the Cook family burial site. Uh, so you can, there's just my garden variety photograph of it. It's actually in, in person right there. It's actually not that hard to read, but in the photograph, you know, it's really hard to share the information. So I did a 3D model of it. And again, the, you know, a sequence of digital uh, overlapping photographs, made the model, took the color out, made the surface shiny, kind of ex exaggerated the relief a little bit, and you get something that you can read a lot more easily. Next slide. So, you know, the, the text at the bottom, it was kind of hard to read uh, in the photograph. Actually, you can't read it in the photograph at all. You can make it out here, uh, make you rest in peace on that. You know, and that's shared out on Sketchfab, so you can see that. But the real shocker to me was there was an additional text that I hadn't even noticed in the field. I did not even see it. Next slide. Word. Rutherford. Probably, probably the stone carver's name. I didn't even notice it in the field. It was just completely invisible. I was covered over by lichen. 
I was focused on the inscription. I didn't even notice it off to the, to the lower right hand side, oh, left hand side. But the photogrammetry makes it really plain. You may also notice that there, um, that you can sort of see some arc curves there. So that's that's um, those are the that's the relic of, of the saw marks when the stone was cut. The lower part of the stone they didn't polish it as completely as the rest of the stone. Not at all visible uh, just looking at it or with other kinds of photographs. So that's a bit that the photogrammetry pulls out some uh, some information about the the techniques in making the stones and the person. Next. Right, so um, reflectance transformation imaging is another trick of the trade. Uh, so garden variety photograph of, of Maria Norse in the family, Maria Norse's headstone in the, in the um, same Cook family burial site. So uh, in RTI, uh, unlike the camera moving, you've got the camera fixed on a tripod, the subject is fixed, but you have a light source, a flash, that you take in a bunch of different places. So Sakura there is, taking, is stitching together um, a number of photographs with light coming in from different angles. And then the, f the free viewer, you have a virtual light that you sort of move around, like you can you put raking light on your, on your virtual headstone from different angles, and again, pulls out text that isn't visible otherwise. You can also make composite images that are a whole lot easier to read. I mean, this is sort of a monochrome version uh, with some, uh, some visual filters applied to it. And now, in this image, you can plainly make, you can plainly read the, the inscription, whereas in my other garden variety photograph, you can't really make it out. Next, so this is how it works. They, you know, screenshots from the the, uh, the software. Moving on, next one. So some things that, that, that came out, like that seven, the date 1847, the top part of the seven had sort of peeled off, and was really hard to read. But with the right light in the right direction, you can make out the top of the seven. Uh, same thing. All right. Uh, Okay, so it was not hard to guess that this was November and that we were missing a V, but it, you're missing some other letters and other words or maybe a sequence of letters. It would have been harder to make out. Next slide. Yeah, so here with the light at the right angle, now the V comes out. So it's a way of sort of teasing out uh, bits of the inscription that are otherwise just missing. Next. Right, here's some, a bit of um, virtual, virtual, uh, virtual RTI, rather. So I did a 3D, 3D model. So RTI in the field is hard because you've got a flash. And um, you know, the distance of the flash of the subject has to be at least twice the width of your subject. So if it's small, you can have a, your, a regular flash that's close to it. But if it's a big monument, um, your, your flash needs to be four to six feet away from it. And most regular flashes are not powerful enough to overpower the sun, right? So you'd have to have a really great big powerful flash and a, and, a, and a generator, and I'm running out of time. So I did this, so I made a 3D model, I did that, and I, so I, I brought that into a, um, um, uh, you know, a, a virtual environment, next slide, you know, with virtual lights and, 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 and a virtual camera, and did the RTI that way, next slide. Um, so part of this is also like trying to find significant uh, gravestone mark, uh, carvers. Uh, this is an example from, uh, excuse me, Frederick County, Sebastian Boss Hammond, so the person who was uh, born in, into slavery, freed himself, was a, uh, was a stone carver, and, and carved these absolutely magnificent, amazing pieces of art throughout Frederick County. And, and I want to know, are there any uh, Sebastian Boss Hammonds in Montgomery County? You know, who are the great artists working in the county? Next slide. So we have some possibilities. It's beautiful Seneca sandstone. Uh, that we have in, um, in, in the county. And you know, maybe some of these are you know, such artists that we really want to know about. Next. You know, the Seneca Samson is like, where the, that's the, the bedrock that produces it, and it's the quarries. But then you know, we've got the rest of the county. So where, where do we find that Seneca Sandstone? Oh, yeah, and that was Clipper. That was the family. That was a name I couldn't remember. <laughs> and, Jack, and it matters, because Jack Clipper was also an awesome guy. He was born into slavery, freed himself, joined the Union Army during the Civil War, and after the war, uh, worked, as a, worked in the Seneca Sandstone quarries. And then there are these wonderful uh, Seneca Sandstone headstones in the family cemetery that are there now in Sino Canal Park, uh, and good that they know about that. Next slide. Um, so yeah, I'm doing more of uh, trying to uh, you know, tease out some things you'll notice. You know, two different, two different cemetery sites, but you'll notice like the, the superscript with the dot underneath, and again, superscript with the dot underneath, same carver, don't know. 
Uh, next and probably last slide. Uh, yeah, we'll just skip through some. I think about it. But these are the, from the Clipper family burial site. Uh, you know, hand carved or vernacular carved, whatever you want to call it. But they they they're really sort of remarkable uh, in their own way. Um, not you know professionally trained stone carvers, but there are these really memorable stones that they created. Next, yeah. So. Uh, you know, I think I'll stop there before we're like completely out of time. <laughs> yeah. Are there questions for any of us? I have one for Brian. Yep. Which family? Awkward or um, The Awkworth family in Montgomery County? Uh, not off the top of my head, but I mean, you know, so I've, I've only been doing this for nine months now, and there are over 300. I haven't, I haven't learned them all yet, but I can look it up. I can look it up this morning. African-American. We've got, oh, uh, so we've got, it's somewhere on the order of 70 to 80. So it's, it's a, you know, a, a good quarter to a third of, of the, the cemeteries in the inventory have an association with, with African-American families, churches, or communities. Um, but um, most of those date from the late 19th or, or early 20th century. So we know we're missing the earlier ones, yeah. a lot of them, yeah. right, a whole lot. So that's one that, actually, I didn't get a chance to talk about it, but I'm hoping to do some you know, additional historical research and what archaeologists call predictive modeling. And by that I mean looking at the, the, the geographical, physical setting of the cemeteries we know about, and then to look for those same settings elsewhere in the county where we don't have cemeteries, to ask the question, well, is there a burial ground there? So that's um, on my, on my to-do list. I'll look for, the, I'll look for that family when, uh, during the break. Okay, good. I'll, I'll check to see if we don't have it, we want it. <laughs> <laughs> yes? How's the archaeology funded? If you find a, a, a cemetery and you think that it's, uh, it should be preserved and recognized, how is it, how's the archaeology funded for it? We're looking at you. Um, on, <laughs> on the next, the second panel, we'll be getting into a little bit more of the actual archaeology program of it. Um, but in, in essence, it is self-funded by the person that cares about it, owns it, or is responsible for it because of some sort of development or permitting. So um, there's very limited funding for you know any kind of state grants or, or local grants for doing this kind of preservation. So it's generally something that's driven by development. Or volunteer. <laughs> exactly, which is why we need volunteers. Yes? Question for Baker Rich. It's under a field up here, and I understand that there's a hillside going down. There's stones that down on that hillside yeah, so my understanding, so I'm friends with the maintenance man, and he tells me all kinds of things. So apparently when we were doing 97, you know, the state has a right of way. Our cemetery runs where that cliff where you're talking about, and the state has a right of way to the cemetery. My understanding from the staff there is the stones were down in that ravine, okay? Because of right now, the last stone with a number is about 1,500, but there's nothing before 1,000. So we have no clue. It's huge. The, the cemetery is massive, but it's that little cliff right there. So there was some talk about this group that wanted to do lacrosse up there, and there was some talk about doing a roundabout. So in other words, you would come off of 97 to a roundabout, and you could cut right over to Crownsville. Well, those discussions were going on. They have since, since died. But the State Highway Administration made a commitment to bring in cadaver dogs <laughs> to make sure that there were no bodies that were in that ravine, ravine over to 97. So yes, there's evidence. And then we were also told, can't tell you his name, he's my best friend now. Um, <laughs> we, 
We were also told that the stones that we see were put back by the maintenance staff of the state that they had all washed out. Yep. What a little sweet talking will do. <laughs> I think I found your cemetery. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I have A-W-K-A-R-D is, is how it's, it's, that's how it's spelled like in, in our inventory right wow. now. But if there are other cemeteries, you know, other. Uh, I'm pulling up the form on it now. <laughs> Uh, so the date range in the, in the you know, this was collected by volunteers, 1880 to 1883. So does that sound right? And we're looking at uh, A U number of names. Okay. Well, let's we'll, we'll, let's. Okay. Any other questions? Another? Yeah. Uh -huh. Base High School. There's a cemetery. Is it closed now? Fence. Is that the document or? Yes. So that cemetery that you're referring to is called Old Sage Bottom, and it is owned by Asbury United Methodist Church. Asbury and Mount Moriah founded Brewer Hill, and then they didn't get along after like one year they had a fight. So Asbury went and started their own church. And what's interesting about Old Sage Bottom, and I know Tina knows, is that our church allowed children or families who didn't have money to bury their children there during an epidemic. Didn't matter what color they were, white, black, or whatever. And um, so the tombstones, the reason there are no tombstones there is because the church let it get overgrown and the city of Annapolis sent a maintenance crew out to clean up the mess. And they said, oh, what is this crunching? We're just crunching through the, you know. And they crunched up all the tombstones, and then there's right. one there. But we, we have now recorded the burials. Because while I was doing Crownsville, if I saw Asbury, Old Sage Bottom, we recorded it. So the church does have the names of the people who were buried there, including Wally H. Bates' brother is buried over there. You're welcome. Can I? I just wanted to say something to, to you, all, all of us who do the professional research. What I found in Anne Arundel County with respect to slave burials, one, uh, a great example, um, the Worthingtons, who still live here in Anne Arundel County, owned Belvoir. Belvoir was once a 6,000 acre plantation. The Worthingtons took me out of the car and walked me down Crownsville Road through the brush to where their family burial yep. is, okay? And this is what they Summer said to me. The slaves are buried over there. What's over there? It's called Summer Hill, is it called Trailer Park? And it's blacktop. So when I, when I talk to you about the blacktop mm -hmm. and African Americans, many times that is what happens. I'm currently working with an archeologist on my boyfriend, Smith Price. <laughs> we know there was another cemetery on Acton and the archeologists that I'm working with are telling me they would bet me money that the people are still there in that location. What is there in that location? a black top parking lot. All I'm going to say is stay tuned. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Uh, question I here. have a question. Oh. Uh, the use of cadaver dogs, how, how far back can you find a grave of work with them for modern? Amazingly dogs? far back. Um, I've had cadaver dogs at a cemetery that was 150 years old that had tombstones dating to 1850. Those cadaver dogs 
spotted on several sites wow. in that cemetery with no problem. Yeah, there, there are claims of even further back than that. I mean, it, it's going to depend some on, you know, soil conditions, but yeah. there, there have been some really encouraging results by, uh, you know, the handful of, you know, rigorous experimental studies that have been done. So it's, it is something that, that <laughs> we're hoping to, to uh, implement in Montgomery County, you know, maybe starting with some sites on, on, uh, on, on parks properties to sort of, you know, establish the, the reliability within our county and, and sort of introduce that to the public. But we, we, I'm, hope, I'm hopeful that that's a, a good technique for resolving you know, our approximate sites and, and helping us find all, all the, you know, m must be dozens or scores of sites that we're just straight up missing altogether. Well, yep. in other words, if they work better on somebody that was put into an iron coffin versus a... No, it, um, the, the bodily fluids uh, seep and out so, into the dirt so. and... and they're right. absorbed into the dirt and in, right, into right. the nearby trees, and, and right. they're focusing on that. Right, but then decomposition may be over. Yeah, but the but the whatever it is the dogs are picking up uh, survives for a very very long time. Yes. Right. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So so no, it's it uh, the results that have been done have been really encouraging. Actually, they're not real precise. It's not as precise as, say, ground penetrating radar. So, you know, ground penetrating radar is going to show you, you know, it's, it's right here. The dogs are going to be, you know, they might be within 10 or 20 feet. But if you're talking about a cemetery you knew or thought maybe was somewhere in this, you know, 100 acre field, yeah. you know, 20 feet is, is, you know, plenty close to be able to, yes. you know, do some additional kinds of investigations right. Right. to find the, the, the actual location. Yeah. yeah, so. So I'm, I, I, my fingers crossed, but we, we certainly hope to be experimenting with that in Montgomery County, and I, I definitely want to hear about you know other counties where it's been used successfully. Well, I'm going to need some dogs for the County Department of Planning and Zoning. <laughs> <laughs> this sounds exciting. <laughs> Did you put them in the budget? <laughs> I have a question for Brian. Yeah. How, how good do you think predictive modeling is going to be? My experience with cemeteries is there is no, no rhyme or reason for them. The question was about predictive modeling. Right, yeah, so that's a, that's a really good question. And, and, and until, you know, I've got a, you know, I've, I've got a model that I'm, that I'm testing, you know, I'm not going to have a good uh, answer for that. But, but just as a hunch, as I'm you know, getting into the cemeteries in Montgomery County, I am noticing some patterns. Uh, that not always, but very often, uh, cemetery sites are, are located on promontories. They're like a little bit of a rise. So you know, for a for a family that has a burial ground near their house, it might be on the, a little bit of a rise, some ways from the house, visible from the house, but on a little bit of a little bit of a small hill, or maybe it's on high ground, but at the edge of a of, of a terrace. So it wasn't really something you could farm, like a little toe uh, of, of a terrace sticking out in, over a, a floodplain. So not really something that would be easy to, to farm, but it's still sort of a high location. And, and there are a number of cemetery uh, sites that, that fit that description. So um, you know, those are just some initial observations that I'm, I, it's not going to be uniform. But, but uh, you know, my first step is to try to break up the you know, the, the to topography that we've got for the county into, you know, the sort of discrete classified, um, uh, you know, uh, topographic descriptions, hilltop, toe slope, you know, floodplain, whatever, just to see well, what, what's the distribution of, of my cemetery so I can start looking. And the other piece is going to be like mapping boundaries of, of properties, especially for, for properties of farms that held people in slavery. You know, to where were the where where was the boundary of that plantation, and that might help me figure out well where where could uh, people who were held in slavery where where could they have, you know, buried their family members. It seems to me that basing your no, predictive model exactly. on what you know already, what you all know already, is mostly Caucasian cemeteries. So you no, no, it's not. No, like not I said, we've got some 70, 80 African American burial okay. sites. We've got a lot. They're just they're just later. They're after the mostly I'd after the Civil War. To see if there's differential oh yeah. yeah. Oh that's believe that, me, that's high on my, my question and list. Is Anne Arundel County? 
budgeting for this too? We, we don't have that level of detail for our cemeteries. We really are at, I mean, it, it's, a, it's so exciting to hear what you're doing and the methods you're using because these are the types of things I hope we can incorporate in, okay. but we don't have that, that fine grain yet. Yeah, he's the one that has the, does the budget over there. Look, <laughs> wave your hand, Phil. <laughs> wave your hand, Phil. I just want to mention also that um, in terms of free blacks, many times we don't go back and look at the records. You know, for example, in the city of Annapolis, there was, um, everybody was looking for the Pinckney um, Cemetery <laughs> down on Georgetown Road, okay? Was that you? Yes, that was me. Hi. <laughs> I haven't seen you in a lot of... So, yes. But it, it actually says the cemetery now laid out, you know, like with my guy um, Smith Price. We know that he was probably, he married a shorter. Her brother-in-law, Charles Shorter, bought all this land, and it's the shorter plat where, you know what I mean? But we have to go back with all this technology. I'm old school. Look at the records. You have to look at the records. It's in there somewhere. It's always a story in there somewhere. But we don't want, everybody wants to be real fast. Look at the book, go in there and look at what they said. The land now laid out for the cemetery. Mm -hmm. So many partials laid out. You know, London Pinckney, he said it. Then the deed disappeared, went offshore. This lady bought the property. And then what do we do? We put it in front of the city of Annapolis and said, nope, you're not burying there because it's supposed to be a cemetery and it was in the records and we had it in our hand, the cemetery now laid out. So I just have to push for, mm -hmm. you know, you got to look at the records. You can do as much technology right. as you want, but you have to look at the records. Yeah. We have the most pristine archives in the country, mm -hmm. right on Rao Boulevard. So just check the records. I'm it, old. It is amazing how references to cemeteries disappear from deeds and stones disappear right. from yep, cemeteries. Yep, 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 yeah, 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 yeah. 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 That's definitely <laughs> a recurring theme, unfortunately. Yeah, yeah we've got a couple. Of, we, we just actually chased down the one. We had a we had a uh, an escape parcel. Uh, Tom, actually, you'll be interested in the, this uh, the parcel. Dove family burial site and Cabin John Shopping Center. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that deed, that deed that you all found, right? So, you know, georeferencing that map, it, gosh darn, didn't it just land right on top of this really odd set of lines in the plats? Uh, and what, it was an escape parcel. So, uh, it's, meaning, so meaning like it? it's not clear who oh, owns it okay, now. Okay, so, okay. Like, yeah. like the, yeah. so the deeds of transactions kind of kind of go fuzzy. And the, and the and the and the headstones are, are gone, but you know it, it you know the that that one deed map lines up very neatly with the plat lines and gosh you go there and there and there are depressions in the ground and all sorts of periwinkle and some cedar trees, <laughs> oh, yeah. and you know this was a, an African American family, uh, uh, you know the, the Civil War veteran yep, and, yep, yep. and you know so but a little bit of persistence and and we're pretty sure we've got the location now and it was considered lost for a long while but we've put that one in the found column yes Yay. okay another question back here so if you suspect you have grave sites or if you, you do have grave sites and suspect, suspect there's more what do, you, what do you recommend for a process to determine that and what sort of expenses are involved um, as far as process goes, certainly contacting our office is a great first step, and then we can put you in touch with the people that can do all of these different methods. Um, consultants like, like some of the archaeologists that you'll be hearing from today that are private consultants can come do you know any level of, of in, in you know investigation to determine the boundaries or start to look at more detail using uh, ground penetrating radar doing some sort of limited physical testing. Um, so it really, each one's a case-by-case -case basis, but it is something that there are professionals that you can hire to relocate and identify. How pricey. I'll let Jeannie we'll take We'll get to that, that later. <laughs> <laughs> so keep in mind that our panel, um, coming up after we take a, a bit of a break, um, we'll be talking a lot more about the specifics of the archeology. span um, So that could certainly be something that maybe cover as the moderator. I can give, give some ranges. We have another question right, here. Yeah. Well, these are all cultural and historical, but have you happened to find any new graves on these? And what, what do you do with them? How do, you, how do you cope with new graves on very old cemeteries? First, 
first rule is call the state of Maryland. Because the first rule is to call the state because there's rules as to what you can, once you find a cadaver, it has to be controls. I mean, and again, you know, with my guy, my boyfriend, if it had not been for somebody calling the state, he would have been in a dumpster somewhere on a backhoe. So the first rule, the first rule of thumb is always call the state of Maryland. What would that be, the Maryland Historical Trust? No, actually the Maryland Historical Trust has very little um, engagement yeah. or oversight with historic cemeteries. Mm -hmm. um, but if but you find remains, if I, I just want to start right office. the state's attorney's office. So that's um, number one. And Go I, ahead. I think what, what um, uh, being familiar with, I think the property you, you <laughs> might be thinking of, um, it's the idea of what if you want to put new burials in an old cemetery and and you know something where you want to keep it essentially active. Um, and, and it's not, and maybe Tina and, and Brian, if anybody else can fill in on this, but my understanding of it is that it's not terribly controlled. So, um, if no. you have an active cemetery, you can pretty much yep. go out and put a hole in it and yes, bury someone new yes. as long as you can demonstrate that it's been in sort of in use. Yeah, actually, um, I don't really think you have to do if, that. If there's room, the you can still bury in an existing no? cemetery. Yeah. Yeah, I think uh, there may be, you know, in some jurisdictions there may be zoning restrictions, but, I, but, but if it's an existing cemetery and an existing use, you know, it's not going to be illegal. As far as the, you, you were just asking me off, uh, sort of offline about, about the, the health department, the, yeah. the, 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 there is a commission for, uh, for uh, uh, cemeteries in, in Maryland, but they, they only control commercial. the commercial cemetery sites. Mm -hmm. So like churchyards and, and family burial grounds, they have no authority over those. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So there's really... The good and bad. I mean, the good is. I mean, if you've got a family, somebody, you know, somebody is, has a burial ground that's been in their family, and the family still lives there, and they want to keep using it, ditto or a church, they can. But I mean, you know, the other, the flip side of that is there's there's no there's no control over this at all. And, and another flip so side is you cannot I start think, your own burial ground. No, if it's not the cemetery before, permission. it would depend on zoning. Okay. Oh. Okay. There's another question over yeah. here. Yeah. I just want to comment on what Tina just said. In some jurisdictions like Calvert County, you don't need permission to, to bury. If you are not in a subdivision and you're not in a town center, right. you can bury somebody in your yeah. yeah, that's yeah. Maryland is. It, it, it changes from county to county in Maryland. It does. What's but, my pearls? Yeah. But but in general, Maryland is really kind of loose about us. It's not yeah. as you know, like Virginia. The laws are a lot tighter. Uh, uh, but yeah. That's Maryland. scary. <laughs> Kirsty, th thank you for bringing that up. Um, we, we only have a few minutes left in this, this panel session, but I'm wondering with, um, with the information that Brian has shared about their work in Montgomery County, the representatives that we do have here from other counties, um, do, do, I hate to put you on the spot, but can you just give a quick um, summary of how other counties are and jurisdictions are dealing with their, their cemeteries, if you or Jen or Roberta would like to weigh in? Uh, well, who started it, uh, I think we have about 180 cemeteries um, mm -mm. Right so far, which kind of worries me because I hear Montgomery <laughs> has 500 and, you know, um, you should so be. I know we have a lot of work to do. Yeah. I kind of do it in my spare time, which I don't have a lot of, mm. um, but we do occasionally get calls from people. We encourage people to call our office if they have a cemetery on their property. Um, when we were working on our historic sites and district plan back in 2010, we did develop a cemetery preservation manual, which is available online. Yeah, that's not nice. And we do have um, the ones we know of. We have in the GIS system. Our, um, I've been trying to get it um, publicly available, but there's some concern about if people know these cemeteries are on private property. Um, there's some concern about that, so we haven't been able to put it um, on our public site. Like in our county, yes. I'm just when you're that. looking the dean is going to say um, Anne Rundle. Get a state ID number, either um, a Maryland inventory of historic properties number or an archaeological site number from the state. And we're trying to fill out forms for each um, cemetery so that's that information is filed with the state. 
That, that brings up a really interesting conversation that we've been having with the state um, archaeologists and how they see <laughs> cemeteries at the state level. Um, there, there's some conversations going on right now as to whether you record a cemetery as an archaeology site right. or as a structure. So the direction they seem to be going on is uh, going in right now is that if there is anything visible above ground right now, they want to see that recorded as a Maryland inventory of historic properties, meaning something structural above ground. If there's nothing left, they want to record it as an archaeological site. Um, that if there's nothing visible to the, the you know the, the layperson's eye, they want to record it as an archaeology site, which means that archaeology site data is not readily available unless you have the special key code or know somebody. The general public can never know about that, mm -hmm. which is an inherent um, bias between the the Caucasian cemeteries that are well maintained right. or more recent are going to be well well represented and publicly right. available. Those cemeteries that have been neglected, have been left behind, that are often associated with an African American community, are going to be heavily underrepresented and even more or less like, even less likely to be protected. Yep. So that yep. designation at the state level can really have an impact on how we can do things locally. Thank you, everybody. So we'll be taking a 10-minute break. Again, help yourself to some uh, snacks. We'll try to get everybody back for the second panel. Thank you. Hello. My name is Jeannie Ward. I am the owner of Applied Archaeology and History Associates, Inc., which is a cultural resources consulting firm. I'm wearing a second hat here because I'm also a trustee of the West River Craker Burial Ground, and we'll be doing tours, pretty informal tours of our cemetery. And if you look in your packet, you'll find a bullet-pointed history of our cemetery along with the, 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 a little bit of the history of the Quakers. So look at that. It'll help. Um, I'm not, am I supposed to introduce the panel first? On my panel <laughs> is, is Tom Bodor, who, who is with Michael Baker and Associates, and I believe he is going to speak about endangered cemeteries and his, his experience therewith. And Howard Wellman is a professional conservator whose brain I plan to pick pretty seriously because our cemetery has whole lots of issues we can talk about later, Howard. <laughs> So I'm, I'm looking forward to both of their talks, but my talk was supposed to be about what you do if you actually have a cemetery. So I'm the person who gets the call from the developer saying, I got this piece of paper from the county and it has this check mark. And it says there might be a cemetery on my property. What do I do now? So if it's just said, if the county has just decided they want you to delineate, delineate your cemetery, there are a couple ways we can go about that. And I have never tried cadaver dogs. So I don't know how, how accurate they would be. Would the county accept cadaver dogs? I, I saw that demonstrated for the very first time a few months ago, and I was a bit of a, um, a skeptic, but it was astounding to watch them work. I'm open to the discussion. Oh, okie dokie. <laughs> I've never tried cadaver dogs. Usually what I tell the people who call me is that there are three methods where we can figure out the, the edges of their cemetery. And, and sometimes you have a landform where it's just really, really clear that the cemetery is on top of this knoll and it hasn't gone down the sides. Thank you very much. Do not ever believe the fence because people can be outside that fence. But if you're, if, you, if you're on the top of a little knoll like this, they're, they're probably not sticking, sticking their relatives on the sides. And one of the things we do in those cases is we have a nice little metal stick. And we take our stick and we probe around, to, and you can tell the difference in, in the soil between an excavated grave and natural soil. And at the West River Quaker Burial Ground, that's how our grave digger makes sure he's not digging into somebody else when he's you know, digging a burial hole. He uses his little stick. So we use that, and lots of times it finds the stones that are now half a foot down. And lot other times, you know, we can pr be pretty sure, if we've got a good landform, that we've got a boundary, and then Jane adds another 15 or 20 feet, and we feel pretty safe about it. 
If that's not possible, there's two, other, two, there are three other means. You can do ground penetrating radar, remote sensing, magnetometry, those kind of studies where they roll the little machine across and they get the nice little you know, graphs that you saw earlier that Stacy put up showing you where the burial pits are. And that's expensive. Um, ballpark range, five to $10,000, depending on conditions. And we don't do that in-house. We hire a subconsultant who's very, very busy. So there's that. Then there's the let's get into destructive, in which case we bring in a backhoe with a flat blade. We, we make them weld over their teeth or use a bucket that doesn't have teeth and pull back the soil until we get to the top of the subsoil. And at the top of the subsoil, you can usually see the burial pits. They are uh, linear burial pits, usually facing east to west. And you know, sometimes they're, they're you know, the little you know, pentagon shaped or, or five sided shaped. And other six, six sided shape. Other times they're just little squares in, in the ground, but we can see them. And in Anne Arundel County, of course, there's no reason to actually confirm that there's a burial in there. So we usually don't go farther than just the top of the subsoil where we can see the pits. We can define the limits. You know, where they stop is the limit of the cemetery. Then Jane adds another 15 or 20 feet. <laughs> and you, you do your development around that. If you can't get a backhoe in and you just want to know if this is a cemetery, we can hand dig. And that's, you know, Janice was talking about the, the cemetery on Georgetown Road, and that's what we had to do there because it was down a big slope and it was heavily wooded and nobody wanted a backhoe to go in there. We went in, we dug a couple trenches, and we found quite a few burials down there, and the marina that wanted to go in did not go in. So there's that. Uh, that's the main way. You know, all of them are expensive. Archaeology is incredibly labor intensive. Heavy equipment costs money. Most people don't try to do any of this unless they are required to because they want to see how close they can get to the cemetery so they can build more houses, which is you know, perfectly within their rights. I've had people ask to move cemeteries, and I have moved cemeteries, but not in Anne Arundel County. I moved uh, one in Prince George's County, that the only reason we knew it was there, it had disappeared from the deeds. All the stones were gone. The neighbors started kicking up a huge fuss at the point where the subdivision plans came out. There was a cemetery there, there was a cemetery there. And we went in, we proved it, and then we moved the burials with the brother of one of the people watching us, which was a little creepy. Uh, he, he stayed and he watched the whole thing. His, his, his younger siblings had died. So we, he, he watched us dig them up and they put them in the family burial ground in Pennsylvania. Then there's the cemeteries that have been moved. And you may have noticed on Jane's slide that it had quotation marks on moved, because moved is not moved necessarily. We just did one in Bladensburg where the church, the cemetery was associated with, was supposed to have moved their cemetery. And Jennifer said, but what about the cemetery when the state went to sell the property for development? The state highway administration ended up moving <laughs> all or parts of more than 100 burials from the cemetery that had already been moved. So you know, it had disappeared from the deeds or you know, officially been moved. Still 100 bodies in there, including a person in a casket who was really, really well preserved. So that, that's kind of my spiel. I'm not gonna talk about the Quakers quite yet. I'll have a lot of questions for you, Howard. And at this point, I'm gonna introduce Tom Bodor, Michael Baker Associates. Hi, uh, I'm, I've got uh, some slides to show. I've got a lot of pictures, so I'm going to try to roll through these pretty quickly. Um, uh, <clears throat> so I'm Tom Bodor. Uh, I am uh, from Annapolis, Maryland. I've lived uh, in this area for most of my life. I now work for a company called Michael Baker International, which is a big engineering and environmental consulting firm. Um, but I was formerly with a small business called uh, the Ottery Group, 
uh, much like Jeannie, we did a lot of work um, in this region uh, on all kinds of archaeological and historic sites. Um, so it's on the main. Um, it's a PDF too. It's not a PowerPoint. Why don't I? I'll just continue. If you guys want to go ahead, that's okay. My my, my the first few slides are, aren't very exciting anyway, so I'll just talk about. It. Um, <laughs> It's, it's the really uh, good shots at the end that you're going to want to see. But anyway, um, so uh, I just wanted to, as a brief introduction, um, cemetery, uh, the preservation goals uh, when it comes to cemeteries, um, you've got, as was mentioned earlier, you've got a, a couple different types of cemeteries, privately owned um, cemeteries, church graveyards, other actively maintained burial grounds. Um, those at like commercial cemeteries, those have to follow specific laws and regulations, and sometimes those laws and regulations change over time. So that there's there's a whole realm of um, discussion around that, which I'm not going to get into. Then you've got inactive cemeteries, sometimes called abandoned. Um, I know there's some um, de semantic debate about whether or not they're actually abandoned, um, but at any rate, they're not typically used any any longer for um, burials. And these typically involve family cemeteries um, that are located on, on private properties. Um, in terms of preservation goals, uh, it's already been discussed that um, there's certain steps that have to be taken. You, identification, which is survey, um, using remote sensing technologies, GPR, even cadaver dogs. Um, oral history is a very good uh, method to, to locating uh, information about location of cemeteries and the contents within those cemeteries. And then you go into an assessment level where you're determining the condition. Once you've identified the cemetery, you're determining the condition, establishing boundaries, and identifying threats. Um, and then you're moving into protection where you're ensuring that vandalism and um, other kinds of environmental natural threats are abated <clears throat> or prevented uh, altogether. And then restoration, which uh, the type of stuff Howard gets into where you're re repairing headstones, uh, you're restoring the landscape around these cemeteries and you're providing accessibility to the public or to family members. Um, and as I understand it, uh, law allows that if you can claim that one of your um, ancestors is buried, even in a private family cemetery, that you actually have rights to that piece of that small plot, um, even if it's on property that you don't own. Um, in terms of uh, preservation outcomes, once you've kind of gone through, you've established your goals and what you want to do, um, the outcomes of those efforts are uh, dictated by, thank you, you can scroll down a few slides if you can get that to work, um, uh, dictated by basically three different um, overlapping tenets. You've got laws, you've got politics, and you've got community support. Um, it's already been talked about the laws and the politics behind uh, these types of resources that we're dealing with. Um, so one more, I think you'll, yeah. Um, but it's really in community support. It's at the community level where um, you see the, uh, oftentimes the biggest um, uh, rise of uh, an effort to protect and, and often and even restore um, uh, cemeteries, and particularly um, family cemeteries, cemeteries of uh, cultural or ethnic have, have associations, um, and in many cases, uh, African American cemeteries. I've worked on a number of projects where. Uh, African American you know, community members have, have coalesced around a burial issue and have um, really taken it to the furthest extent to where those cemeteries were ultimately protected and restored. Um, next slide. Uh, in terms of outcomes, uh, this pretty, pretty much speaks for itself. Um, preservation in place, it just, it's a, it just kind of continues on. There's no real threats to it. It's going to continue on. Um, on the good side, you've got actual restoration. Uh, and accessibility, uh, and on the, on the bad side, you've got destruction and loss through neglect, uh, generally through neglect, uh, sometimes through active uh, destruction of cemeteries, which is one of the reasons, by the way, why Prince George's County now has an ordinance that requires developers to do archaeological work on their subdivisions. It's because a developer uh, about 14 or 15 years ago decided he was going to try to remove a cemetery on his development parcel over a weekend, and he got caught. Um, so, um, 
cemeteries are often, uh, are typically looked at in terms of their significance through their architectural or design features, uh, monuments, landscapes, um, other kinds of formal aspects of cemeteries. And then the next slide uh, is um, uh, cemeteries are found to be significant through their historical and cultural association. So you've got mounds which don't, burial mounds, which don't exist in this area at all, but um, again, landscapes, architecture, um, in interesting, uh, unusual types of um, local family cemeteries like that. Um, so in terms of impacts and threats, obviously the biggest impact uh, and threat to cemeteries is development, land development, highways and subdivisions. Uh, as I mentioned before, um, <clears throat> Prince George's County uh, requires developers now to do archaeological work, not just to locate cemeteries, but to locate all kinds of archaeological sites. Um, and so this is typically a situation where you're going to, you know, where, where they will uncover something um, with, when they're grading and removing that kind of land. Next slide. Um, this is a, just a quick picture of a situation down in Virginia uh, that I worked on where um, we had done actually a lot of archaeology on this site. Uh, this is actually a discovery of a Native American bundle burial that was um, uh, located right underneath the carport of a 1960s home. Uh, right adjacent to the property that was being developed. And uh, we consulted with the Native American tribe down there, is uh, just in um, Gloucester Point, Virginia, uh, and they wanted us to leave the remains there. So they left the remains in place, and um, not such a great place to commemorate somebody, but that's what they chose to do. So next slide. So I want to get into a couple of uh, case examples of um, how threats are abated. Um, Asbury Broadneck Methodist Church is in Cape St. Clair, Broadneck Peninsula. Um, historically, it's an African-American congregation established in 1849. Um, that church is not the original church. That was built, I think, in the 70s. Uh, the original church burned at, along with all of the church records having to do with their cemetery. So um, that was a very unfortunate situation and not uncommon, actually, uh, where you just don't have records anymore. Um, Asbury Broadneck uh, applied for a grant uh, through the Alliance for the Chesapeake Bay, which uh, in conjunction with the DNR uh, was granting, um, providing grants for projects on church properties where they had stormwater issues. Um, so the intent of this project was to deal with stormwater, not the cemetery itself. But it was a twofold uh, situation where you had um, major amounts of stormwater, un you know, sort of sedimented flow coming through this churchyard and flowing down in the Chesapeake Bay. And the Alliance for the Chesapeake Bay wanted to curb that. And um, so they funded this project. Um, but in the meantime, it was in a churchyard. It was a graveyard associated with the church. And um, so there were obvious potential, there's an obvious potential for impacts to occur as part of the stormwater uh, mitigation project where you, they could have impacted graves. So um, next slide, we were uh, called in. Um, to assist with this project and uh, work with the engineers to ensure that no graves were, were impacted for this project. Um, Asbury Broadneck Church does not show up on the 1860 Martinet map. The arrow basically is, is roughly where it, it would have been. 1878, it does show up as this colored Methodist Episcopal Church. Next slide. Oh. Asbury Broadneck Church did not burn. The records were that someone else. Oh, that's, I'm sorry, that's correct. Someone yes, thank you for correcting me. Just, that's you know, correct. Just to make yes, correct. thank you very much. <laughs> Unfortunately, they were in somebody's home that burned. That's right. I'm sorry to make that mistake. Um, so, this is an aerial image. The church is down here. I just wanted to show the, uh, the graveyard here, uh, parking lot. This is Broadneck Road. This is a historic road. Um, the, uh, you can see some of the, uh, these are the uh, burial vaults, the surface vaults, which have um, heavy con uh, you know, uh, cement lids on them. Um, this section of the uh, property is probably where the earlier graves are located. Um, there's fewer headstones there. The ones that are there are the older ones. Um, these up here are going to be the more recent uh, burials. It is an active cemetery. Um, and so the church hired uh, another outfit to do, come in and do ground penetrating radar 
And the GPR did uh, locate a number of gra unmarked graves, actually quite a few of them, mostly up in this section of the property. And if you go to the next slide, um, I put this up just to show, so here's the church property. These are the uh, waterways coming down. This is the headwaters of Whitehall Creek. Um, and so this, this is the stream that was causing a problem running right through the cemetery, right through the middle. If you go back to that previous picture, um, it comes right through here. That big tree right there, which is no longer there because of the project. The stormwater is running through there. Um, this actually, I just want to point out, this was a clover leaf done by the SHA. Um, and this wetland in here, which is still there, as you can see it today, it's actually a very thriving wetland. Um, that was actually, I believe, a um, mill pond um, for a mill that was located down here. Um, so lots of history in this area. Um, <coughs> Route 50 um, obviously disconnect, you know, really kind of cut right between these two areas. This road used to connect down to here. And so you can imagine back in the uh, middle part of the 20th century, it was a much different community back then before the highway came through. So let me go back up. This is what was happening. Um, the water was flowing through here at just uh, unprecedented uh, um, volume and rate. Um, and you can see these are the burial vaults here. The coffins inside, those are more recent burials. The coffins were floating up and pushing the concrete lids up. Uh, as far as I know, nothing ever came out, but it was a dire situation. Um, and, and, you know, this is what would happen. Um, and there are burials. There are unmarked graves underneath this water. So it was an obvious situation where not only was it a stormwater management issue, but it was a real <coughs> concern for the church and for the, for the graveyard there. So um, uh, the um, uh, engineering firm developed um, this plan, which shows uh, pools, step pools there in blue. Uh, we overlaid that with um, a potential, uh, basically a rough potential map showing areas where we didn't believe there would be, um, there was a lower potential for, for graves to be found versus areas like this where there were, we knew there were unmarked graves there through the GPR, but we knew that the GPR only identified some of them. There were, where, where you find one in the GPR, there's off, you can often find more that the GPR might miss. So as Jeannie mentioned earlier, um, we, uh, we, did, we had the GPR data but we needed to ground truth. We needed to verify because this was an active project that was, had a real potential to impact these graves. So we wanted to know how many were there and where they were exactly. So we did bring out a backhoe, smooth blade bucket, um, stripped off about six inches of the topsoil, and lo and behold, you start to see the grave shafts pop up. You can kind of see them in that picture as well. <clears throat> Um, so we worked with the engineers and the county and the church to basically uh, map these and then uh, the project was uh, what started um, to, to, develop, to deal with the stormwater issue and that aerial image up on the upper left shows uh, that project, shows the fencing uh, protecting you know, areas outside of that where there, where there are known graves. Um, and we did some archaeological <coughs> monitoring as well, so we had an archaeologist on site during some of the work here. And this just shows you the level of destruction that was necessary in order to create the stormwater, you know, to, to, to um, do this project. Um, and there are other examples of these. There's one in Eastport right now. If you drive down into Eastport, there's a church there that has finished this. And it's a quite a, a large scale operation. It's not just you know, digging a little trench for the water to go through. So um, this was a really uh, good project to be involved in. Next slide. So the next project I want to focus on is um, a small family cemetery called the Whedon Family Cemetery. And I noticed there was a name Whedon over here. Um, uh, this is a cemetery that is located outside of Annapolis, also on the Broadneck Peninsula, and um, has been, it was uh, severely impacted by uh, a continuous uh, sort of flow of storms coming through the area, but particularly Hurricane Isabel. This next slide. Location here, um, the big circle is the Whedon family home site um, from the uh, early 19th century. The house is, you, you wouldn't know it was an early 19th century house. It's been really transformed quite a bit. The small red circle is the cemetery. Next slide. Uh, historical map showing uh, Whedon, uh, Whedon, William Whedon, and then 1878, the, it says 
Weldon, but that's Whedon Ayers. That's the same property. You can also see the difference uh, changes in the shoreline here quite dramatically. And then if you look at the quad maps, the quadrangle maps into the 20th century, it, 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 it really has transformed uh, quite a bit out there. Next slide. So when we, I got a call, this property is, uh, this, the cemetery is, is on property managed by the Chesapeake Bay Foundation uh, on Holly Beach Farm. Um, interestingly, the cemetery is now on a separate parcel from the Whedon house. So I don't know how that happened. I really, you know, because obviously it was there and somehow the surveyors came in and the county approved the lot lines knowing that the cemetery, family cemetery was on the outside of the lot. So now Chesapeake Bay Foundation has this under their um, uh, stewardship, and uh, so I was contacted to come out and help with, uh, basically do a volunteer effort. This was not a project related, uh, this was not something that we were paid to do like the other project to come in and help. Uh, so we, we amassed a large group of volunteers. Um, this is basically the condition of the site right here. Um, some of these, the headstones, John Whedon is the one I'm going to be talking about mostly here. This is the um, stone stonemason's uh, name, who's it was in, uh, engraved on the pediment stone, not on the main headstone. That was on the pediment stone, and I believe that name, his name, would have been under the ground surface when it was um, set in place. Next. So we, um, after about a two years, actually, was it was about two years. I first saw the site, and then it was maybe less than two years. We we amassed a group of people to come out. And uh, there were two iron coffins that had, had eroded out of the sandbank. Um, one of them, this one, was laying right at the base of the, the bank. And there was another one, a uh, fully sealed iron coffin that had drifted out and was setting, sitting about 50 feet off from this location. So uh, I suspect that it floated when it, when it fell out of its, um, the bank. It somehow made its way 50 feet further out. This one stayed you know, right basically where it was, uh, right, it had fallen out down. Um, this is the headstone just laying flat at the edge of the, the bluff. Um, so this is a uh, 1849 iron coffin uh, man manufactured, I believe, by the Fisk uh, Coffin Company. Um, Fisk, uh, was, uh, Almond Fisk was the guy's name. He had a patent for these things, although he was not the first person to uh, manufacture iron coffins. Um, this is a fairly early example of one. It was 1849. You see other examples uh, throughout the Civil War era and even after that. But then they really kind of discontinued um, because they were just found, they were too cumbersome and, and um, expensive, I think, as well. Um, so we go to the next slide. Um, this is the condition of the shoreline after all the storms and the flooding and so forth. It was a mess. Um, this is the coffin that had floated out and was in the water. We hauled it out with our trusty volunteers. Next slide. We had to get these coffins up onto the sandbank and then um, back into the cemetery itself where uh, we dug shafts, grave shafts, and reburied these coffins. Um, Iron coffins uh, have a great, there's a great fascination with iron coffins in, uh, among historians and among archaeologists and other people who are interested in, in graves. Um, there's, uh, there's, a, there's a lot of reasons why people would have chosen to bury themselves in an iron coffin. Um, John Whedon, um, his headstone, which was one of the earlier photographs, had a willow and an obelisk, carved willow and obelisk. And you've probably seen this before. It was a common uh, theme for headstones uh, back, as I understand it, in the mid-19th century. Um, the willow is a symbol of mourning and grief. The obelisk is a, um, an Egyptian reference to Egypt. Um, and um, interestingly enough, John Whedon also had an iron coffin that was formed in the shape of an sarc Egyptian sarcophagus. So it, it's interesting. I don't know anything about John Whedon. I've looked him up. There, you know, you can only glean so much from the from the census records, and you don't know who these people are. But I think John Whedon felt very highly of himself. I think that he probably, you know, he had to order this coffin before he died, and he spent a pretty penny on it too, as compared to a pine box. Um, and so he had this ordered before he died, uh, and then when he died. 
the uh, tin plate there was etched with his name and his age, age 74. So it had to have been put on after he died, otherwise, he, unless he knew when he was going to die. Um, so it's just really interesting. It kind of takes you right back to the moment where, you know, the family is trying to deal with this, his death, and they're making these decisions, and, you know, they know how he had already laid out his, his plan for his own death. Um, and um, the idea behind these iron coffins was that they would be used to um, preserve the body so that uh, there would be another, a, a future date at which that person would, you know, come back to life. And um, there's, so there's just this whole spirituality over that that really is, it begs for more research, I think. Um, but it does, like I said, get you back to the point where you can kind of be there with uh, the family and understanding what they were going through when they laid uh, Mr. Whedon uh, to rest. I think, the next, is there one more slide? A couple more. So these are the iron coffins um, in better condition. Um, just some advertisements. The window plate uh, was so that if your loved one died far away, they could be transported back to you and you would, within a week or two, and you'd still be able to look at them. And um, They do mummify the remains. I've, been, I've seen uh, actual examples of, of these things being found where the remains, uh, there was a, a one at Quaker burial ground in Alexandria where um, uh, they found one, and the person, the remains were perfectly intact, um, full beard, full hair, um, buried with a top coat, no pants, and no shoes. Because <laughs> those shoes, shoes were valuable back then. <laughs> this is an un, this was a, a un uh, um, molded. This was just a, a, a straight iron coffin, no molding or anything. It did have the window plate. I think this was John's wife, Martha. She also fell out of the sandbank, unfortunately, and she drifted out. We had to get this thing. This was still sealed, um, and it was filled with water. Um, so we took extra care in moving this one, because um, if that had broken open, it would have been a, not a very pleasant situation for, the, for those of us trying to move it. Um, next slide. So we prepared the uh, new uh, burials, and uh, this is uh, John Whedon. Um, most of, unfortunately, most of John had uh, washed away uh, as he laid on the beach with the coffin broken, but his, um, his skull was still there inside. It's his headstone there laying flat. Um, by the way, headstones are quite large. I don't know if you all know. <laughs> They're very tall. So we, uh, we, we did our best. Um, to do this, this is just a, a like I said, a volunteer effort. Um, it was just a one-day excursion. We had a good time doing it. A little bit solemn. We all felt very good about it, though. I have to tell you, this was a, a very personally rewarding um, project, uh, and I think all of us felt that. So I think that might be it, or is there one more? No, nope, that's it. That's what I have. Thank you. exacerbated by uh, development uh, around the area. And I think Route 50, I think the construction of, of Route 50 actually exacerbated it. So it was a combination of things, but they were actively trying to deal with it for, I think, a very long time. Uh, and ultimately, the grant from the Alliance for the Chesapeake Bay is what saved it, uh, I think. Um, so it was a great project because not only did it mitigate the stormwater issue, but it helped to preserve the cemetery. When they purchased, first purchased the cemetery um, a long time ago, there was a natural gully running through the middle of that cemetery. And eventually it just opened up and opened up and opened up and it just filled with the lot. Let's hold the rest of the questions till after Howard. I'm sure we'll have lots more at the end. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you for asking me to participate. This is always a fun sort of event to come to. Um, I'm a professional objects conservator. I actually started out uh, as an archaeological conservator, working on archaeological sites and in archaeological laboratories, preserving artifacts. I worked for the Maryland Historical Trust for seven years and overseas, and then got 
interested in historic cemeteries and masonry conservation, stone conservation, and that caused me to go into private practice. And so now about 50% of my work is historic cemetery preservation. The rest of it I work with you know, monuments, bronzes, uh, outdoor art, public culture of that nature. So I'm just let's just carry on. I've got a lot more pictures than time, so we're going to fly through a lot of these. Um, this is actually the second part of a two-lecture series. The first part of my lecture, I usually talk about the initial survey of a cemetery. Um, and in an ideal world, I would be doing that in concert with somebody like Jeannie or Tom, where I would be focusing on the gravestones, not so much the landscape or the infrastructure, um, but looking at the condition of the initial gravestones. And I have my own kind of idiosyncratic method of walking through a cemetery, looking at each individual gravestone, recording its condition, and then setting priorities. And of course, one of the big questions I always get, especially some of these larger institutional cemeteries, is there's so much to do, how do we choose? And I, I'm happy to talk about that perhaps during the tours, but I think we're gonna focus on, we're gonna flip through the next, can you go one? So, well, I'll quickly, basically I have it in my mind, I set up a kind of a triage situation, and I have three priorities. If this is undamaged, maybe moderately soiled, or maybe it's in complete collapse, I tell you, don't worry about it, leave it be. Next. If it's fallen over, it's probably not going to come to too much more damage. Leave it be for now. And then next. If it's tipping like this, if it's rocking, if it com comprises anything approaching a public safety hazard, that's your first priority. Because the last thing you want is a visitor leaning on a gravestone and it falls over and either damages the gravestone or falls on their dog who's sniffing the other side. Um, and I do know, in fact, that um, in Scotland 20 years ago, that happened. A gravestone fell over, a child was killed, and the Scottish Parliament rushed through a law that said every standing <coughs> gravestone must be laid flat in the entire country. So proper maintenance avoids situations like that. So moving on. Um, conservation maintenance. I'm going to talk about a few basic things. S what I would call simple maintenance, which would be cleaning or resetting fallen gravestones, and then slightly more complex treatments such as construction and filling and repair. So moving on. Simple cleaning. Is cleaning really all that simple? We heard uh, Brian talking earlier about acid rain damage to marble gravestones. Marble is a lovely, beautiful stone. It carves easily and it's horrible to maintain. I, oh, sorry, take it back. This is not acid rain damage. In my opinion, this is cleaning damage. This is somebody who thinks marble must be white. And so they scrub it and scrub it and scrub it every year, and sooner or later, it looks like a melted candlestick. So one of the things I always say is, know why you're going to clean it. Do you have a reason to clean it? Are you cleaning it because you think it should be white? think again. Are you cleaning it because you can't read it? Let's talk about some of those tricks that Brian was talking about and some other things we can show you. Okay, next. Um, biological stain removal. Most soiling on gravestones is either simple wind-blown dirt, and you can take that off with a garden hose and a soft brush. You don't even need soap sometimes, or detergent. I should be more clear, detergent. Most of what you're seeing is biological. And the technical term now is biofilm because you never have one thing. You're seeing on these stones, you're seeing a combination of algae, bacteria, fungi, and lichen. And they, they colonize and form communities. There's an entire unique ecosystem living on the surface of that stone. And you can come in. There are products out there on the market. I've used them myself. We can say the name. It's D2. Anybody can buy it. And you can clean these beautifully. The problem is, and anybody who saw Jurassic Park remembers the line, life finds a way. It always comes back. We did a project of cleaning gravestones at Congressional Cemetery. We, we decided, okay, we are going to take this 100 by 100 patch. We're going to clean every gravestone in it with D2. It looked beautiful. Two years later, they were black because that's the first biota that comes back is the, is the black cyanobacteria. So the natural reaction is, oh, we've got to go clean it again. Then I went to a conference where somebody said, oh, by the way, the biofilms develop resistance to the cleaning method. 
So sooner or later, you're developing a superbug that's going to shrug off your D2, go, ha ha, and start turning green at you again. So again, I really hesitate to clean anything unless there's a concrete reason and you're willing to deal with the fact that it's going to get dirty again. <coughs> Metallic stain removal. This is actually a stone that I dealt with at uh, the Mac Lab when I used at Jefferson Patterson Park. This came from the city of Alexandria and it was a, uh, a gray stone that was found in a trash pit on an ex during, a, during a development excavation. It was an archaeological excavation. Um, so it was just covered in scrap metal, which is why it has all of this extensive iron stain. And so I did some experimentation with processes that I found in the conservation literature and found that you can, in fact, reduce the chemical staining, the iron metallic staining in these stones. And ultimately, it came, back looking like, came out looking like this. So it, it went from that really nasty red to this kind of off gray, which was more visually acceptable because I think this was ending up in the Alexandria Museum uh, at the torpedo factory. This is something you should not attempt on your own because the chemicals I had to do, I was working inside a fume hood just because of the odor and the toxicity of some of the chemicals. If you find a, mir a miracle product at Home Depot that says it'll take your iron stains off of your porch or your stone or your whatever, Call me first, please. Because <laughs> some of those have side effects. Um, they, they, are, they, ha they, ha they are probably developed for a very specific purpose. Conservators, archaeologists, we are working under really tight budgets. We love to find the cheap alternative, but we have to test them first because sometimes there are long-term consequences to these things that show up in our literature but is not going to be on the product label at Home Depot. Next. Uh, resetting. Some resetting projects are very quite simple. And in fact, I work with a lot of volunteer groups and I love to do training on things like this. Oh, this is a lot of things that people can learn how to do. Congressional Cemetery again. Uh, this is one of those very simple rocking stones. Um, but you can see it's also got uh, pretty severe erosion and that is due to the iron pin. Whenever you see a crack on a face like that stone, that's usually stress erosion and st because of the corrosion of the iron pin that's holding the structure together. And in this case, it was pretty simple. They lifted the stone off, as you can see, it's a fairly small headstone, and just cleaned up that surface, cleaned these surfaces, next. And then rebuilt it with an appropriate mortar. Again, mortar is one of those things that I can talk about for days, mostly because I'm still teaching myself. I'm a self-taught mason, which means I'm really dangerous at it. Um, but mortar is one of those things that you really have to pay a lot of attention to. And again, don't go to Home Depot to buy your mortar. Anytime you're dealing with a historic gravestone, the last thing you want to do is a, use a proprietary mortar unless it's one of, those, one of those products specifically designed for historic masonry. Anything with Portland cement in it, run away. If it's soft lime, natural hydraulic lime, I'm happy to get into those details with you. Um, and that's basically what they're doing. In this case, they're using a, a, it was a mixture that they had developed themselves using natural lime, extremely fine mason sand, a couple other little additives. And it was as simple as putting down a mason bed, dropping the stone. Now this, this was a corroding iron pin, but they cleaned it up. It was still straight, it wasn't loose. Leave it be, put it back. Next. And then ultimately they filled that crack with another packing mortar. Now joining, joining again is something that can get very, very tricky. Um, I was lucky, this is one of the first gravestones I ever joined, put together. And I'm lucky because one, it was family, so nobody could get mad at me about it. Um, but it was a very, sim a relatively simply speaking, a horizontal crack right here. And that piece was simply resting by gravity and friction. And in this case, I did insert pins, clamped it, used a saw, used a, a patching mortar, an appropriate patching mortar, and that was the end result, and then filled the crack, and that was the end result. So for a first time out, I thought I was pretty darn lucky. <laughs> Next. Um, void filling. This is where you're starting to get into some tricky stuff. So this is a delaminating sandstone. This is actually Loudoun County, Virginia. So nobody from Virginia here, I don't think. And this is one of those cases where the inscribed surface, this was a 1650 graystone. The entire surface is delaminating off. Most people have probably seen the way sandstone and some limestones will just flake away in layers. Um, next. And so in this case, I was using an injectable grout 
Um, again, a this was a commercial product, but again, intended for historic masonry. And so I was literally filling in, I had to go to the extent, this is something I don't like having to do anymore, but I was actually finding those pockets and voids within the stone, drilling very tiny portholes and injecting a grout to fill that void, cement the whole surface back together. Again, do not try this at home without a lot of practice. Next. And in fact, some of these products you can't buy unless you've taken their training. So quite often you'll find materials that you just can't use unless you've had professional training. And, and this, is, this is me uh, literally using a turkey baster just to in injecting this material into those, into those cracks and grouts. Next. And coming back, filling the cracks. Next. And that was the end result. That was about three days' work. And then, of course, getting into loss compensation. There are a lot of products out there. If you have a crack, if you have a missing section, there are a lot of products out in the market. Um, again, you can tint them, you can change the composition, you can add aggregate, you can all add all sorts of materials. I, again, just my personal philosophy is I try to avoid the ones that have a lot of synthetic materials out there. There are, there are a lot of things that are one step removed from body putty, from auto body putty. I've actually seen gravestones mended with auto body putty. <laughs> um, I try to go for the things that are more historically accurate, more natural historic materials. Again, practice a lot at home if you ever feel tempted to try this. <laughs> Next. Um, this is one where I kind of had to pull out all the stops. This was another gravestone from Congressional Cemetery. Um, it had fallen. This portion was lying. These pieces were all lying in the grass, and there was one section still in the base. And as you can see, they lost about three to six inches from the center of the gravestone. So I more or less had to compensate as best I could. And in this case, I did use stainless steel pins to hold the whole structure together. Next, please. And then filled in as best I could what I assumed was the missing area with one of these lost compensation materials. Um, that's the close-up of what I was missing. And for safety's sake, I figured it was probably closer to six to nine inches was what was missing. I compacted that to three inches. Just otherwise, it was just going to be this wobbling structure with very little support. So that was just a conscious decision made with the cemetery management to put it back up, but do the best we could so at least it represented the grave site. Now this is, this is kind of what I like to show, different, different historical repairs over time. Um, traditional Mason's Dutchman repair. Um, all, literally, they had failed stone, so they carved out a section, inserted a new piece of stone. Traditional Mason's repair. I have no problem with doing that. I wish I could do it that cleanly and that neatly. Um, and then you see an awful lot, especially again, these delaminating stones, beautifully <coughs> made caps. This is hammered lead just sealing the top of the stone. Because again, some of these delaminating stones, they open at the surface, weather, soil, biota, they all get, insects get in there and just helps push those laminations apart. But if you can cap it, I think that's a perfectly appropriate set. Um, the bad, I showed you that cleaning one before. And then this is my uh, typical failed epoxy mend where they had what was a traditional uh, tablet set into a slot. Something hits it, that's where it's going to snap off. So they just came through, squeezed out some epoxy, put it back down. Ten years later, it falls over again. Um, epoxy can be wonderful in the right circumstance, but it doesn't like weather. So epoxy joins will almost always fail. Um, I have some colleagues who will disagree with me on that point. We'll keep that conversation private. Um, and then this, again, Congressional Cemetery, this is where they, uh, they lost the granite cap. So they used one of these modern synthetic cast stones. And just ultraviolet, sunlight and weather, caused all of this failure. Because synthetic materials don't like sunlight. If you're going to use a synthetic material, you're going to have to screen it or shield it or protect it in some way. Um, and then this one, again, this is, this is, not, the, this is not the Bondo repair but it's something very similar. Um, there's a lot of epoxy squeeze out in there. One thing I do like to 
show about this, about talking about the biota. One thing you can do to control biota is cut it off from light. You will notice down here, see this little shadow? That's where that cross used to rest. And the shade of that cross was sufficient to reduce the rate of growth of that biota. Um, I actually think I have Kirsty to thank this. <coughs> Next. Um, so again, whenever I'm looking at a project, I'm always trying to choose the right materials. Um, and I have to say, there's never a single right answer. I have a very old joke. If you ask the opinion of three conservators, you're going to get five solutions. <laughs> So here's a very well-meaning repair. They wanted to set this gravestone up. They need to put it in something permanent. So they literally cast it into a concrete block. Now the concrete block has now cracked, is under stress. And because this is so firmly bounded together, sooner or later, whatever caused that stress, assuming it's still there, ground movement, something of that nature, that stress is now going to translate to the original monument. So by putting it inside something that's wrong, you're actually sooner or later going to cause more damage than you're trying to <coughs> fix. Next. Um, having the right tools for the job. Gravestones are heavy. <laughs> I'm getting too old to do this by myself. Um, it's always good to have, have either lots of friends, as we saw with <laughs> uh, Tom's photographs, or having the right equipment to do the job. Uh, this is St. Anne's Churchyard in Church Circle. We were uh, rebuilding the Carol box tomb in the front churchyard. Um, treatment costs. Everybody wants to know what does a conservator charge. Um, these, this, this one took us a couple of hours to fix. It was quite simple. We picked it up, cleaned up the pins, put in some new mortar, lay it back down. This one turned out to be a bit more complicated because, simply because one, we had a gantry to lift the pieces. Each one of those pieces weighed three, two to three hundred pounds. Um, it's all so it doesn't look like it. It's all solid marble, beautiful marble. The biggest issue was that we had to redig re the foundations. Um, a lot of this, this is from the, um, the old Berlin Cemetery out in Brunswick on the Potomac in Maryland. And a lot of these gravestones had been cleared off the site by well-meaning city workers and then hurriedly brought back in when the neighborhood complained, and they didn't bother to put them back where they came from. So a lot of these things are literally just sitting in the dirt. So we ended up having to dig and pour foundations for a lot of these. That's always where the money ends, ends up, is if you have to start moving things around, making foundations, that always ends up making work. Um, but that's, that's a fair estimate if you're paying full rate. Next. And then where do you get help? You don't have to call me. I like it. I love it if you do. Um, there's a benefit to using volunteers. There's a benefit to having professionals. The great benefit is using both. Volunteers can do a lot of work in a cemetery preservation project. But you do have to make certain that they're working, they understand what they're trying to achieve, what their standards they're working to. Um, in your folders that you received today, there's a little two-pager. It's what I consider to be professional guidelines or standards for doing cemetery preservation work. There is no authority behind those statements other than my own professional experience, so you can take that with a grain of salt. But the important thing is that whoever is working on it should have the right degree of experience and training, and there should always be somebody on the other end of the phone when things start going south. Um, but I love working with volunteers. I love motivating volunteers. Um, and there's a great deal of um, joy in having a job well done. And if you do need to find uh, professional conservators, there's a couple different online venues for that. Um, unfortunately, some of the, uh, some of the things, have, uh, American Institution for Conservation has changed. I, sh I, need, I need to upgrade this. But again, I have my business cards here. I'm happy to put you in touch with the appropriate information to help you move forward with your projects. And then again, a lot of these uh, websites have a lot of good information. And of course, again, this, this, this uh, presentation, I put this together for the first time about 10 years ago. And I do definitely need to upgrade it. So there's a lot of much better information online now, especially at the local level. As more and more of our county and municipal governments are going online, there's a lot more local information that's available. So I'm, I'm really happy to learn about some of that for the first time here today myself. 
And then I have a whole other presentation on DIY information uh, versus what you can find on the web, on the internet. There's a lot of bad information out there. Um, so really, whatever, whatever you read on the web, take it with a grain of salt. Even if it's on my own, or even some of my own professional colleagues, I take a lot of what they say, and I, bet I measure it up against my own personal experience. To me, the most important thing to do is read the references. Um, if somebody says, this material is the miracle cleaning solution for your gravestones, if they don't give you scientific backup, if they don't even give you the, MS, the, the material safety data sheets for this material, be suspicious. Do some background research. Um, make certain they're not trying to sell you their home, their home cooked, whatever it is. Um, find the science. Find someone like me to say, hey, have you ever heard of this stuff? And you know, maybe there's literature on it and say, oh yeah, we've been using that for decades. It's great stuff, go for it. Or it's like, oh, that's the knockoff of that Chinese product that was first developed by the British after World War II. And yeah, you can't use it in this country because of EPA regulations. <laughs> you, know, you find all sorts of interesting things. Um, and then I am a big fan of the NCPTT. Uh, they do workshops all over the country on cemetery preservation. Um, if you get a chance, this is how I got started. Um, I, I realized I had a gap in my professional knowledge. I went to one of their workshops and I was hooked. Um, they even gave me a t-shirt, so. <laughs> <laughs> and a badge, so. Um, and then, I think that's the last one. Yes, we're done. Um, <laughs> that's my cemetery joke for the day. Um, I do have my business cards. I'm happy to consult with anybody by email or over the phone. That's free. Um, I would far rather talk to somebody for half an hour on the phone or trade emails and get you all on the right path than get the panicked call on a Saturday morning of, oh my god, what do we do? So I look forward to talking to you with you during the tour as well. We have 10 or 15 minutes for questions. And Howard, you're not going to be too mean to me when you get to my cemetery, right? <laughs> Conservation chemicals that end up getting used in the cemeteries. I'm thinking of, you know, some people using shaving cream to like mark a, you know, sort of, you know, to be able to make the inscription visible, yep. and also exfoliants like uh, uh, Roundup that might get used to, you know, um, remove the weeds. Um, highlighting highlighting inscriptions is one of the biggest questions you always get. Um, shaving cream is cough is commonly, you know, squeegee it on and then wash it off. Anybody who applies shaving cream knows it's greasy. You can't wash it off with water. Those oils could potentially penetrate the stone and they will stay there. And depending on what kind of oils they are, they're not always natural biodegradable oils, they could be there for decades. If there's anything with any silicone in it, the silicone will actually resist future conservation treatments or potentially contribute to resistance. Um, I see people rubbing just like uh, playground chalk across the face of a gravestone. You're eroding the gravestone. It's, you think it's really soft, it's chalk, it's not gonna do any damage. Go to any of these marble gravestones, simply press your hand against it and pull it off and what's stuck to your palm? Usually it's white crystals, we call that sugaring. Um, and then also, I have seen people do the chalk and then they walk away. And so you're left with this red, white, and blue gravestone. And they're saying, oh, it's going to wash off the next time it rains. It doesn't. I've seen chalk persist for weeks, months, a year or more. I, in fact, I did a cemetery. I, I restored a cemetery in my hometown back in Maine. Um, I did all this beautiful work on it. And then I came back the next summer. And somebody over the winter had gone in and chalked all the gravestones to, for their own photographs or their own, their own record taking. Um, yes. What would you recommend to someone who just wants to go into a graveyard, <coughs> sees, a, sees a stone there, they can't quite read it, 
they want to read it, you know, how do you... There are lighting tricks that we, I can show you in the graveyard. It, it, it really comes down to, Brian, Brian's talking about doing that on the computer. There's a lot you can do with a flashlight. And a mirror. Or, or, and a, or a mirror. Or, or, yeah. Sorry? Spray it with a water bottle. Spraying it with water helps. That's also a good one. Just anything to change the contrast, um, that's what you're trying to get. So, so our gravestones have uh, lichen on them, mm -hmm. yellow stuff. Yeah. It look, I can take my finger and wipe it off, mm -hmm. right? Is that, can I just get people to come in with claws and just wipe it off? Um, it depends on the, subst on the stone. Okay. Again, if it's, and, and again, one of, I think the science is still out on whether or not those biofilms actually help protect the stone. In some circumstances, I've seen where those big fluffy leafy lichens, the stone under it is better protected. It's, I mean, it's almost still polished, whereas the exposed areas are eroded. So I understand your point. There are, we can talk about that, especially in the gravestone, in the graveyard. Um, it really depends on the stone and the nature of the stone, because even just rubbing with a cloth or your, or your hand, if it's one of those sugaring stones, you're peeling the stone away. So we can, we can talk about that. It, but again, it always comes down to it depends. If there's and sooner, a problem, and sooner or later, I'm going to want to get there with a, micro, with a handheld lens and just look at the surface of the stone. If there's a cemetery problem, you will see it at West River Quaker Burial Grounds. Yeah. So we'll, we'll have a lot to talk um, about. The, the, I'm going to get back to Brian's question, because the other thing everybody wants to know is cleaning solutions. What do we clean it with? I'm always going to say, again, this is, this is conservation training. You always start with the mildest possible option, and that is water. If you have to, add a few <coughs> drops of what we would consider a non-ionic, a very mild detergent. Um, literally, a few drops. All you're trying to do is break the surface tension. You're not trying to make foam. You're not trying to make bubble bath. And then you always have to have a lot of water to rinse it off. If you've got a hose in your cemetery, you are blessed. Otherwise, you're backpacking all your rinsing water in. Um, the, some of the products like D2, they are great. They work. And the best part about them is, again, for really sensitive gravestones that you absolutely have to clean for reading or documentation purposes, you can spray it on and then walk away and come back two weeks later, and it's clean without you touching it. It's great for that. But again, then people say, oh, well, if I scrub it, it's going to be better. Or, well, I have to do it again and again and again. So you always have to learn the limits of the product. And again, D2 is expensive. There are competitive products out there that are cheaper, dollars, you know, doll, you know, dollars to $100 cheaper. Again, what are they intended for? That's, that's why I talked about the Home Depot. The Home Depot solution is what is this stuff really intended for? What's in it? You know, D2 is specifically for the biota that live on masonry. If you're buying deck cleaning fluid, the pH is probably different. The acidity of the solution is probably different. The chemistry in it, it's attacking different biota. Um, it's all very specific, so you really have to read the literature and make certain you know what you're using. We tried another one that started with a O. Yeah, I guess. Okay. And the D2 worked way better. Again, um, but I, I have a friend at the Park Service who, is, who has, in fact, tested some of the other brands. And I think Clorox has a masonry cleaner. And she says some of those in her tests, they work just fine. They are cheaper, in fact, than D2. I don't have those names in front of me. Sorry. I haven't tested them myself. I haven't had a chance to. So. Zach? Yeah, my, um, my question is in delineating and identifying sites. And obviously, we have all these great techniques now that are helping us identify sites. But for some of these marginalized communities, the sites aren't obvious or aren't on obvious landforms and things like that. So I am a field archaeologist, and I do a lot of phase ones. What's the probability of catching a cemetery on phase one on a marginalized land plain? Yeah, I imagine it's really low, right? But also, what might the artifact assemblage look like if you didn't find the obvious thing? the gravestones, sunken depressions. Is there much of an archaeological presence on these sites? And Vegetation, you know, perennial, perennials where they shouldn't be, vinca, Osage oranges, yucca plants. Um, yeah, not, not many artifacts. I mean, yeah. you're, you're not going to really find anything. Um, Unless it's a recent cemetery where they like tchotchkes. 
Yeah, right. Right. Uh, yeah, an unmarked cemetery, unless you're finding depressions, sometimes just rocks yeah. where they shouldn't be. Bold, boulder grave burials, field stone burials. Un, yeah. they're un, it's just literally, it's a rock yeah. where yeah. it shouldn't be. Yeah. This is really common, but if, but if they're in, in a row, you know, particularly yeah. like depressions associated, that's a hint. I'm, I'm cur I haven't had a chance to experiment with it. I'm wondering about uh, the possibility of, of uh, infrared photography. You know, essentially the idea being that, that uh, the different density of a grave shaft compared to the surrounding soil matrix may give it a different heat exchange characteristic hmm. that might be detectable in, in certain you know, multispectral imaging. I mean, that's, you know, that's kind of edgy, but it's not invasive is the advantage. Right. Um, so I, I have read some articles that suggest there's a, a potential there, there, but you know that's that's bleeding edge, you know. <laughs> technology. Um, one of the things I always look for, you know, if you if you have depressions, is whether they face east west. Yeah. But we've noticed in our cemetery, our older burials are north south. Really. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. I've noticed. I mean, so I look at, at orientations. I mean, it's um. It, they do vary, and actually, with some older uh, burial sites, you know, uh, they may be laying them out not by, uh, not with a compass, but just on, on uh, where the sun is rising and setting. So the orientation actually varies with the seasonality of the burial, yeah. and you can actually there are places where you can actually verify that that yeah, it's the, they're they're oriented east west for that time of year of, of the burial, and then maybe mm. later on they're doing it with a compass. But then there are still other instances where where cemeteries are, are laid out according to some uh, geographical feature, a road, a, you know, a fence line, the house, something like that. So, so the east-west isn't always a, it's most common in, yeah. in Christian burials, but it's not universal. And, and you also have to be aware that quite often cemeteries get tidied up. Oh, yeah. And all of those nasty wiggling lines get put nice and razor straight. Mm -hmm. oh, yeah. Especially with, with um, the headstones that are just uh, resting in a base that's lying on the surface, oh, they move. Yeah. <laughs> Gravity yeah. alone will move them. Yeah. Never mind mowers and, and people and who knows what. So they're not necessarily where they're supposed to be. Yeah. I think another thing I forgot is if you have one stone or two stones, you probably have 20 burials. The first, well, I think the first cemetery I messed with in Anne Arundel County, there were two headstones, and they were gonna widen the road, and they, all they needed to do was delineate those two. We brought in a backhoe, and 17 or 18 burials later, we quit delineating, because they, they they, there was no widening of that road. It wasn't gonna happen at all, so. I wanted to add uh, to the north-south, the orientation, and actually, and then just before I forget, I, um, I did one project in Anne Arundel County um, up in Arnold recently for a developer. A developer. Uh, there was a one headstone on the pro on the property who it was it was a headstone for a, a, for a U.S. Colored Troops um, per, uh, soldier, um, John uh, Wright was his name. Um, only one headstone on the property, and. Um, we all felt that there would be more, and we did bring in backhoe to look, and we found two. There was John Wright, his headstone was more or less in the right spot, but there was somebody next to him as well. And it was only two where we looked. There, you know, it, it, we were limited by where we could look in that particular case, so there could have been some on the adjacent property maybe, but that wasn't part of our survey area. The north, south, east, west alignment is interesting. Um, I did a project down where I actually found that, we found that bundle, Native American burial, uh, same site, um, early, mid 17th century settlement in Gloucester Point. Uh, we found two burials under a uh, blue, crushed bluestone driveway. These burials dated from the mid 1600s. They were literally right under the, the bluestone driveway. We scraped that back, and, and suddenly there were these burials there um, from the 1650s. One was a, we had them uh, analyzed, investigated very carefully by Doug Owsley at the Smithsonian. Um, one was a white woman who was probably an indentured servant. <coughs> she was buried east-west, and uh, about 10 feet away from her was another burial that was buried uh, north-south, and she was an uh, African woman. Um, who her bones told us that she was 
right from Africa. Um, it was, it's actually one of the earliest um, African burials in Virginia that's been found. And she was buried north, in a north-south alignment. And uh, you know, I think that that was more of a, a cultural tradition, maybe. But then there's the other aspect that sometimes people who were um, problematic for the local community, um, criminals type people, they would have been they were, uh, buried not in an east-west fashion because of their, presumably because of their crimes. Or 180 degrees is what I've read in some Or flipped time. around right. so that so they, like, right. The idea is that you know, the, the resurrection, you rise and you're facing the east. Right. So, Fe so the head is to the west. Yeah. That's right, there that too. This is where burials have been found where the head is to the east. Um, so, right. uh, and, and then there, there was, you know, there was some record of that person having been, you know, marginal in some way in their community. Yeah. like. Uh, uh, considered immoral or something like that, and right. so the community buried them in the opposite direction as a comment on them. So that there are records of that as well. We need to wrap it up. I saw one more question. <clears throat> yes, it's about your slide, but it was turned off. <laughs> I, I was looking at the slide, and uh, it's a curious stain that you got in the left. Um, Did you get to clean them? Or? Uh, well, maybe we can go back and we can figure out which <laughs> picture. Does anybody have another question while they're... I, I have a comment. Okay. Um, people are not generally aware that if you have a grave, a tombstone, that that is owned by that family, that they are responsible for the upkeep of that and if stone is broken, uh, the cemetery itself is not responsible for it, that family is responsible for it. Um, that's uh, a problem with a, a, a lot of cemeteries nowadays. The problem would be finding the family. very last one, the done. Question. There was one more question back here. Was there one there was, more question while we had the somebody slide? Somebody else had their hand. Two more. Weed prevention. It was mentioned, but oh. Um, Are you coming on the cemetery tour? <laughs> no. No. All right. Um, I don't think that Roundup actually is a problem with masonry. But it's a problem with cancer. You've heard this. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and, and I have heard debates about the science on whether or not it's carcinogenic. Of course it's so. carcinogenic. Well, yeah, people have heard that the, 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 the salt's in it. That, that okay. Yeah. Well, in which case, All right. the, best, the best thing, of course, is to landscape so that you don't have weeds. All right, we Brown had our two is. spots up. Now it's one right there. Now we're going to do a stadium. I, I never treated this gravestone. I took the picture because of the, the name of it. Um, I'm suspecting that that is probably biological. You can probably clean that off with soap and water, detergent and water. However, I do also see there are some stains that develop on carved granite that are completely unremovable. Um, and I have, again, my friend at the Park Service has been researching this. She can't find anything that shifts some of these things. She thinks they're biological, but there's some form of bacteria, <coughs> staining bacteria, that you can't touch. The only thing she's found is she had a piece, of, she had one of those gravestones with the lead coping over the surface. It was the runoff of the heavy metal was the only thing that was that staining material. Um, so, you know, there are some stains you, you cannot get rid of, and we still don't understand what they, what they're coming from. Now, if you've got half a million dollars. All right. What, what's up now? All right. Um, so Stacey's going to uh, just have a few closing comments, and um, I cannot thank the panels enough. I, this has been some great conversation. I've learned a lot today and have lots more questions. So we'll uh, pass it over to Stacy to just have a few wrap-up comments. And then we'll get into lunch. Well, thank you.
you so much to our speakers. This was, I think, a great conversation, and I'm sure we're going to have more in uh, the burying grounds when we have our tours in a little bit. Um, so uh, I think one of the things that's hi been highlighted over this conversation is it really takes a community, it takes a village to um, you know, understand these cemeteries, to protect these cemeteries, to care for these cemeteries. Uh, we, um, we have some challenges uh, with the county, um, but we have an amazing uh, citizenry. Who ha like All you people who showed up here, clearly you care about these resources. These are important historic resources. Uh, so we, um, you know, we want to keep these uh, cemeteries intact. Uh, Darren, if you could get to the next one. We kind of covered all of this. Um, but we have had a, you know, a couple hiccups. Like, here's a county park, Lentingham Walks. Um, this is a, a historic cemetery. Uh, looting is a problem for some of these sites, but in this case, the Friends of Groups stepped up and they added security um, to the site. Uh, and if we get to our next slide, um, we've also got those unmarked unknown sites, but we've had uh, amazing volunteers go out, like Tina Simmons, pictured here, um, who have uh, documented that for us. So, um, you know, we were talking about the challenges of, uh, doing a phase one survey, an archaeology survey, in uh, finding a cemetery sometimes if you don't know it was there ahead of time. There's a lot of clues, but sometimes there are none. And all we have is oral history and doing a more extensive than a phase one, which is just shovel test pits that are 50 feet across or a walkover, um, you could potentially miss a small family um, burial ground. So if you don't know about it, um, then you, you know, something could happen to it. And that's why we count so much on people telling us and listening to the community um, about these um, oral histories about where the burials for the enslaved people are from a plantation. So uh, we, um, we've been really fortunate to have such amazing volunteers out there uh, documenting that. And um, we have some books up here where you can see where some of it's been documented, like right here, cemetery sites in Anne Arundel County, Maryland. Um, from Tina, and Tina's going to bring out some more books later from the Genealogical Society. Um, Darian, if you think. But uh, we also have a few things coming up where we're hoping we can um, encourage uh, more community involvement too, because Tina and Dennis Green, who's sitting next to her right there, have been out there walking with uh, other members of the Anne Arundel Genealogical Society, but we need more people on the ground. We have over 500 cemeteries. We need more help <laughs> to do this. And uh, we need to get our spatial database um, a little bit better than, say, t there's an oral history that on this 200-acre piece of land, there's a cemetery somewhere. So someone out there probably knows where it is. Uh, so we have a, uh, this new program that we're implementing. And uh, we're, we're going to have a, one of our first set events is in October at Kinder Farm, where we're uh, looking into um, basically uh, getting as many people on the ground who can help us out and report. So we have in your packets a survey form, hard copy that you can actually download from our webpage uh, at acounty.org cemeteries. It's right here. But we also have a really nifty tool online. So if you, um, you know, say you're with the kids with a smartphone, it could be fun for them too. <laughs> or, um, or our more tech interested folks, although technology is not always the most reliable in the field. Um, but we, uh, if you see this QR code on the back, you can scan it and you can get to the digital survey tool as well, which you could use on your smartphone here. So I have a QR scanner app that I have right here. And I can scan it, open the link, and it takes me directly to that. So if you're in the field and you come across something, this is a direct link to our office where you can report that this cemetery exists on your property, neighbor's property, or if you're walking down the road. And this is an important data. That little step that you take, that helps us protect it. And we, bypassing the MIH <laughs> That's right. So that's, that's part of our long-term goal. Our, our goal is to actually develop a standardized inventory form for each cemetery site in the county that talks about the historic significance of each of these sites. So this, this data is going to help us do that. Uh, we also have, um, so we have our, our cemetery preservation stewardship program where we're going to do a volunteer orientation where we can talk to people about how this survey form works and how our digital survey tool works. That's in October at Kinder Farm. And we're, um, if there's interest, we're going to do another one uh, sooner, if you'd like, 
uh, in late August, and I have a sign-up sheet here for our Citizen Preservation Stewardship Program. I don't know if we have the budget yet for t-shirts, but there's definitely a membership card involved and direct <laughs> access. <laughs> well, we, we can work on that. Um, and uh, so that's, uh, the, please do sign up if you're interested in being on the mailing list and learning more about that. And, and it's an amazing way to learn about your local history too, just to go out to these sites and see that the connections that you start seeing as you're looking at these names or start talking to the community, um, it, it just, you know, cemeteries really are the nucleus of that takes us back to the past. So another resource we have that I forgot to tell you about at the beginning, probably because I blacked it out, because we, we just printed this out for you guys. It's our cemeter Historic Cemeteries in Anne Arundel County Resource Guide. Every one of you should have one in your packet. And this goes through what our compliance code is. It directs you to our uh, web page where you can get to the survey information. It also has some tips in the back, just basic conservation tips and other resources that you can find. <coughs> um, Howard gave us a great uh, handout in your packet as well that talks about conservation tips. And Tina has a handout in there so you can do some more research and look at our local resources. Uh, so Tina and I will be out there in October at Kinder Farm. Hope to see some of you guys there. Tina's also got some cemetery inscription things happening. One of them's next weekend. She's very busy. <laughs> and uh, so if anyone wants to get out there and look at these cemetery inscriptions at um, uh, Bestgate, in an, uh, uh, Bestgate Memorial Park in August, and next weekend is at St. Anne's Cedar Bluff Cemetery. So uh, just a housekeeping thing, we would love your feedback. We want to know what you guys are thinking when it comes to these cemeteries, what's important to you. And thank you so much for coming. <laughs>